Assalamu alaikum everyone. Good morning. Um, so we are about to start our head and neck cancer session. Let me introduce you to the panelists. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Arif Shamshed. He is our head and neck radiation oncologist with plenty of years of experience behind him. Uh, with him, we have uh, Professor Abdul Ahmed. He's OMS head and neck surgery. Uh, he's from Northwick Park, London. Um, so I'm going to invite Professor Ahmed. Um, he's uh, into innovative technologies. He loves to incorporate cutting edge things into his work, such as robotics, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, he runs regular microvascular head and neck courses, the very famous London Flap course. So Emma, thank you very much for coming all the way from London. Um, here you have Mr. Abdul Emma. Well, alaikum, everyone. Um, can you close the door, please? So the, the noise, can we just close that door? Yeah, thank you. Right, um, so thank you, Dr. Fessel. Um, this is my third time in Pakistan um, and my second time in Shokat Khanum. Um, so I think I was here two years ago before Peshawar and I gave a lecture on a reconstruction and um, using the use of augmented reality. So um, inshallah today, I'm gonna do something a lot more simpler and it's just to discuss the management of uh, salivary gland tumors um, and basically talk about minor salivary gland tumors, uh, protic gland tumors, uh, talk about how we manage them in a simple way from diagnosis to surgery to radiotherapy. Um, and then the second part of my lecture um, will be uh, looking at the facial nerve and how we look at the facial nerve and the, some of the options that we have for the facial nerve. So the first slide, I just want to show you, this was from Thursday, and I was I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Raza and Dr. Faisal and his team uh, with regards to, um, you know, the surgery. So what we did was we performed uh, surgery, uh, live surgery uh, um, in theater at Shokat Khanum. Uh, we did a yeah, okay, yeah. We did a, a, a neck dissection, a resection of a, a, glosse, a, a tongue, and then reconstruction with a radio forearm flap. And this is um, um, some, some trainees from Sindh province, I was told, um, and they're watching uh, through the live uh, video feed. And it's just, uh, it's amazing some of the, you know, the things that we can do. And inshallah, hopefully we'll be running something like this uh, next year. And we'd love for all you guys to attend um, if you can. Um, it's really, really good to, because uh, we had live commentary. Uh, my voice did run out eventually, but we had live commentary of each part of the surgery. And just, you know, um, it, was, it was quite a pleasure to do. So inshallah, uh, maybe we'll see more of you guys next year. So moving on. Uh, this is one of my cases, the patient um, with a large uh, tumor of the protid gland. Uh, um, this patient had agoraphobia. Um, and so basically he was afraid to come out and eventually someone ended up going to the nursing home and saying there's this massive thing growing it's almost a twin so they had to send her into hospital and then I had the pleasure of seeing her and this is her just in the OR before we did any surgery it was it was you know so um so we let's talk about salivary gland neoplasm so it's not that common um, usually um you get it in the protic gland but you can get it in the other minor salivary gland so the submandibular gland the sublingual glands, and there are also obviously minor salivary glands all over the oral cavity, including the palate, the soft palate, the hard palate, uh, and the cheek. Um, you can also get um, METs from skin malignancies of the scalp into the protid. So again, that can cause um, some metastasis to the, 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 the salivary glands. In terms of the protid, so this is another one of my patients uh, who had a a tumor of the left uh, left parotid. Um, usually they say that a lot of them present as painless lumps. Um, so they're quite benign, they're very slow growing. Um, and they always have this rule of thumb, which is that 80% of parotid lumps uh, are benign and 20% are malignant. Um, and you can, and the most commonest tumors that you get are Warthin's tumors or pleomorphic adenomas. And that's really the thing that you need to remember, pleomorphic adenomas and Warthin's tumors. And also, obviously, you can get malignant tumors, and we will be talking about malignant tumors. And the most common, commonest ones that you need to remember, uh, if you're doing any exams or just, just, just off the top of your head, is mucabidomoid, um, adenoid cystic, ascenic cell, and adenocarcinoma. And there's also, um, and there's vari variations of the theme. 
and there's also carcinoma, expiomorphic adenoma. So those are the really common things that you we, we, we tend to see. Right, so um, in terms of the minor salivary glands, this is uh, uh, most likely a minor saliva. This was a pleomorphic adenoma on FNA, so, so you can get them in, in different parts of the oral cavity. Uh, what we find is they tend to be more malignant. So when you get tumors in the, the, the kind of, you know, the soft palate, hard palate, uh, some mandibular gland, sublingual gland, they, then you always fear that they, there's a propensity for them to be more malignant than benign. So it's always a, there's always a concern and they always tend to uh, present as a painless uh, mass. So this was uh, a young chap who had a, a benign pleomorphic adenoma and all, all he had was a simple excision in case you were concerned uh, with a little, uh, with a nice little scar just here. And it was absolutely fine. So now let's start with the clinical pathway. So the first thing is with all these things is obviously presentation. So the patient presents to you uh, is clinical examination. So in terms of the examination, you want to be looking at obviously any nerves that are nearby. So for, for example, the facial nerve, um, the tethering to the skin, is it mobile? Is it, you know, um, is it fixed? Um, I think all these things, how long it's been there for, um, all these things are quite important because they kind of form a basis of your suspicion. And the next thing that we do is, uh, in my practice anyway, is to do an ultrasound and an FNAC. So the ultrasound FNAC, it can be quite sensitive, it can be quite specific. These are some series of papers from, from over the, the last 20 years possibly, um, in my unit, I would say it's between 86 to 90%. So what we mean by that is that if I do an ultrasound FNAC of a lump, uh, a, a, you know, salivary gland lump, then there's about, depending on what the results come back, there's about 86% chance that what they say it is, it is. So if I do, a, I don't know, a parotid lump, I do an ultrasound FNAC and it's come back as a pleomorphic adenoma, then I'm, I'm about 86 to 90% sure that it is a pleomorphic adenoma. Can it be wrong? Yes. OK, it's never 100 percent accurate, but at least it's something to go on. All right. Now, what you will usually find is well, not usually it can happen is you get a bad sample. That's the first thing. And the second thing is you get a nondescript, uh, you know, uh, unsure. And they give you a list of um, uh, um, possible scenarios. They'll say could be a low grade carcinoma, could be a benign pathology could be salivary duct or something, something. So you get this unequivocal finding, all right? So that's, that, that's, that becomes, becomes a problem because what you need to know is the diagnosis. That's the first thing. So what we tend to do in my practice is if the FNAC is unsure and I'm not convinced um, and, and if it doesn't just fit or it's a minor salivary gland, then I do something called a core biopsy. Now a core biopsy, if you don't know, is very similar to an FNAC. So it's a needle. You it put the needle in, it's usually ultrasound guided, but the core biopsy is slightly bigger and it takes a core, okay, of the of the of, of the tumor or the lesion, and then it's a histological sample. So for an FNAC, it's cytological. So you basically look at the cells and it's cytological analysis. With a core biopsy, it's a histological diagnosis. Now, is it 100 percent accurate? No. So I've had cases where we've done a core biopsy. And the core biopsy has become unequivocal, or they're not sure. And if you speak to pathologists, I'm not sure if there's any pathologists in the audience, but it, the salivary glands are always difficult uh, to fully diagnose sometimes, even in the final specimen. So again, you're never 100% sure, but I would always recommend, if, you, if, this, if it's available, is if you get an ultrasound FNAC, it's a bit unsure, then I would suggest you get a core biopsy, okay? And the next is an MRI scan. Now we tend to get MRI scans in the UK, but as I said, it depends on your availability, it depends on the cost, et cetera, et cetera. But an MRI can be helpful. First of all, it will give you any other lesions. It might give you, um, obviously the FNA will also, uh, the, the ultrasound will also show you some neck, if there's any neck nodes. But the MRI can tell you whether it's a deep lobe or superficial lobe, depending on the position of the retromandibular vein. And I'll show you some scans of MRIs where it's even more detailed study of the facial nerve. So you can look at the facial nerve anatomy if it's a parotid tumor and give you a rough idea of where everything else is surrounded. And depending on the lesions, like for example, a palate, you may even get a CT scan because you may want to see whether the bone has eroded, whether the heart palate has eroded, for example, and that will obviously decide uh, your tissue planes when you think, come to think of doing resection. Okay. So... So if you think about it, 
We talked about ultrasound. We've talked about FNA. We talked about MRI and CT for bony invasion. And here you can see uh, a, a, a huge uh, a protected lump, a tumor. And then this is a, um, a 3T MRI, okay? Um, and what you can see with that is by reconstructing it is where the facial nerve is and how it's pushing back the facial nerve stump. And it gives you an idea of where everything is before you go into surgery. Now, this is useful for the surgeon because he, in his mind's eye, they understand where the facial nerve is, where the tumor is. But also, um, you know, it helps the patient as well because you can show this to the patient to demonstrate the complexity of the upcoming surgery. All right. So that's a 3T MRI, which you can use for reconstruction now. So you've done everything. So you've done an FNAC, core biopsy, you've done an MRI, and then you've decided that it's benign, okay? So it's come back as most likely a pleomorphic adenoma or a Warthin's tumor or a lymphoepithelial cyst. I mean, those are the usual uh, things that you're going to get. So once you've decided that, then you've got two options for surgery, all right? So the first option that I offer patients, depending on the size of the tumor, so if it's a small tumor, uh, and one localized is an extra capsule dissection. Um, and then, and we will talk about that and you'll see a video of it, so don't worry. And the second option is a partial or a, or a superficial protodectomy or a wide local excision, obviously if it's not in the parotid. And that is again, something I will show you uh, in a video of how we do that, okay? So those are the really the only two options in my mind, when it comes to thinking about surgery, so you, you know you don't um, you don't do a lumpectomy, uh, you don't just you know um, go through the skin and there's 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 a way of doing this that you know has to be followed and respect tissue planes, which we'll talk about. Okay, right. So let's talk about yeah. So we talked about that. So you can see here, this is the tumor of the accessory uh, lobe of the parotid, and it was palpable intraorally. Um, and it was, you know, it was quite distal. And so what I did was an incision in, in the oral mucosa and the buccal mucosa, and then literally opened it up and then did an extra capsular dissection. So like with the, with the, with the this was a pleomorphic adenoma. So with the pleomorphic adenoma, it has a capsule. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly well-defined capsule. And what you can do is you can dissect the tumor out, okay, uh, uh, in a, in a, it's, it's a nice tissue plane, an avascular plane, and then you can close it. And so that basically removes the tumor. And there's a very minimal scarring, nothing on the face, everything's on the inside. And, and you know, it's, it's done. All right. So now let's talk about extra capsular dissection. Now you'll have people say, for example, in a parotid gland, that an extra capsular dissection of a, say, a benign tumor has risks. And the major risks are, First, of course, that you'll have a close margin, okay? So it's a benign tumor, but the, the, the tumor has a potential to become cancerous if left be, behind, all right? And if you leave it for long enough, every year there's an increased chance of it becoming something called, uh, you know, uh, carcinoma pleomorphic adenoma, all right? So now, the, the, always the question is about margin, about, you know, you're going to leave something behind or you can spill it. So tumor spillage is another thing that you have to worry about. And that's because uh, it's obviously a capsule, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's a pseudo capsule. It's actually not a true capsule. And what that means is that if you're not careful, you could spill the tumor and seed the tumor, which means that there's a chance that it could, you know, come back in the future, right? Now, the argument for ECD, there's been lots of studies. And the argument for is that, first of all, it's a, it can be a simpler operation if um, you've been trained to do it there's less morbidity, you don't expose the facial nerve, okay, and you basically just uh, go around it, and I'll show you a video of it, um, and there's less risk of having transient problems, but not permanent, the permanent's the same, but also things like fistulas and frays and things like that can be reduced. Now, in this case, this is one of my cases, okay, so if you have a look at this, this was a deep tumor, deep lobe tumor on the MRI, okay, and what I did was, it was a pleomorphic adenomus, it was a benign tumor. And the only way to approach this, to reduce the morbidity is, first of all, I um, found the facial nerve. So there's the digastric muscle, and there's the facial nerve. I have written it in case, you know. Uh, there's the facial nerve, okay? 
And there's the superficial lobe of the protein. So what I did was I dissected the facial nerve, mm -hmm. lifted the superficial lobe of the protein, okay? And then there you can see the tumor. And what I did was I dissected around the tumor, removed the tumor, and put the superficial lobe back. And so that way you get a nice cosmetic, um, you know, there's no, you know, it's not gone flat. It's a, they're still full. There's less risk of having things like frays and silocyls because you bring the fascia back as well. And that was probably the only way I could approach this, right? So, because even, so if you did a superficial protodactomy on this, you wouldn't, like, there's the superficial protod, I've done that. But ultimately, in some cases, you have to do an ECD if it's benign. And the reason why you have to do it is because it's just the only thing that's possible, okay? So there are lots of studies uh, which I won't go into. So, so we talked about ECD. So this is going to be a video of an ECD. So if you put the music on, I'll play it. Okay, so this is a lower point of the protein. So there's nerve monitoring. This is available on touch surgery, by the way, for free. It's an app, iOS and Android. And it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it. Okay, so it's just a bit saturated, but I guess that's just the way it is. I think it's the screen. But I'll, yeah. So the, 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 uh, I don't get any royalties for this, by the way. Um, this you'll see better on your on your phone. You can basically go through the steps, right? So the first thing you do is obviously you get to the protein fascia. I'll I will speak this up. Okay. And essentially, what you're doing is first of all remove lifting the investing fascia. And then once you find the protid fascia, you go through the protid fascia in a cruciform uh, way. And then you literally uh, open the, uh, the protid fascia out, which you'll see, and I stitch it, yeah? So what I do is I'll stitch the protid fascia because I'll put that back. And the reason for the protid fascia is important is because you don't want silent seals and things and phrase. Okay, so there's the the the, uh, the stitches, and then it's just simple blunt dissection around the tumor, and you may encounter a branch of the facial nerve at the base, but obviously because you're quite close to the tumor, you can see it. You've also got nerve monitoring, and then you can just dissect it off. Yeah. Which is the last bit, I think. There you go, there's the tumor. And then you close the protein fascia and then the skin afterwards, okay? So it's quite a really quick procedure. So in some units or something like this, they would do a superficial protodectomy. Now, superficial protodectomy would involve an incision all the way along here. It would involve finding the facial nerve. It would involve taking the, you know, um, partial, probably do a partial protodectomy, a bigger scar, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see, and, and would take a lot longer, all right? So this only takes about half an hour to do. And so if you're in a busy unit and you've got lots and lots of these cases, then it's, it's a very straightforward procedure to do. Okay, so here are a couple of cases. So this is another ECD. This is an ECD. And here you can see an intro one. That is the protid um, duct, the orifice just to mark out and then simply incision along here and then removal of the benign uh, protein. Remember, this is these are all benign, okay? Now, so for some benign tumors, okay, you have to do a partial protodectomy or a superficial protodectomy, first of all, because it's fairly big um, and you can't just do an extra capsula. And here, is a superficial protodectomy in about a couple of minutes, okay? So the first thing to do is a modified blade incision. And then you raise the skin flap. And here you can see the, 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 the protid fascia. Can you see the white protid fascia? 
And this is um, a really nice thing that reduces the number of residents I need. Okay, and so then now I identify the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Okay, so that's the base. And here there's the avascular plane between the tragus and the parotid tissue. Okay, so it's always anatomy, right? So SCM, parotid, avascular plane. And then what I'll do is I'll show you. Now, there's the digastric, which is very, very important. So it's the posterior belly digastric there. And between there and there is where I expect the facial nerve to come out. And so what I do then is just simple dissection in that area because I know that the nerve will be coming out there, okay? And so I just have to gently but slowly, slowly but surely find the nerve. And there you can see the nerve. Can you see the nerve appear? There. And then the rest of the procedure is effectively the section of the facial nerve. And so all you're doing is going around the facial nerve and then lifting the tumor off the facial nerve. But remember what I said about margins? Usually these tumors are on top of the facial nerve, which means that your deep margin will always be abutting the tumor. So it doesn't matter if you do an ECD or if you do a superficial protodectomy, ultimately, some of the margin will be abutting it. And that's kind of the principle behind it. Because if, if you have to do this anyway and leave a deep margin that's like close because it's a, the capsule, right? Because it pushes. So then doing an ECD, it's the same principle. So it, it's just the other margins. So effectively, there is, that's always going to be the case because all these tumors are always on top of the nerve on the superficial part of the, the protein. So no matter what you do, you will always have a deep margin that's close. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how you do the procedure, your deep margin will always be close. Okay, and so here you can see that the, uh, the tumor has been removed. It's a benign pleomorphic adenoma and the facial nerve has been dissected, okay? So let's do some cases. So this is that lady that we saw at the beginning. Um, and you can see I raised the skin flap a little, it was a bit more difficult than normal. And basically what we did was we, uh, we lifted it all up and you can see it's still going, 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 going still. And then eventually push, 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 find the digastric, find the facial nerve, and then dissect the facial nerve off. But again, the deep margin is the facial nerve, right? And so the deep margin will always be involved. And obviously the superficial margin is close as well. But anyway, it was fine. So, okay. So these are some, this, this is another way of, sometimes you can't find the nerve, um, Sometimes you can't find the nerve, so looking, uh, sorry, sometimes it's difficult to find the nerve at the back because the tumors push the nerve back. And that's when you can do a retrograde approach where you look for the superficial nerves. So here you go. And then you can work your way back, 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 back to the facial nerve trunk. So can you see that? So you can just work backwards, retrograde, going back, 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 slowly, slowly dissecting, and then you're back onto the facial nerve. So you can, there's, a, there's another way of doing it. All right. So let's talk about malignant, okay? So that was, we talked about the management of benign tumors, all right? So we talked about examination, ultrasound, core biopsy, MRI, and then depending on the size, the site, you'll do a extracapsular uh, dissection or you will do a, a protodectomy, which is a partial or a superficial. So now, in terms of malignant tumors, the commonest ones I've just mentioned are things like mucopidermoid, uh, which can be low grade, moderate, and severe, uh, yeah, and then adenoid cystic, ascenic cell. And there's, there's lots of other ones, including carcinoma, XP from adenoma. So this is the case. Uh, if you can see, you can probably see it. There's a lump in the right palate adjacent to the upper right seven six tooth. Okay. So your differential, I think she had this for, I would say, a few months. And the dentist did some x rays. There was no periapical pathology. So it was not a dental abscess. Um, and so uh, she came into our, our unit. And so what we did was we did a, um, um, a biopsy, which is straight down the middle, a core biopsy. And the core biopsy came back as 
a polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma. Okay, so it's a malignant cancer. All right. So let's go back to that pathway I talked about. So we got to this point. We've done the core or the FNA, and it's come back as malignant. All right. So it's come back as one of the ones we talked about. So now, if it's in the parotid gland, you're looking at a total, subtotal parotidectomy or, a, or, or something of that nature. And if it's not in the parotid gland, it's either a removal of the submandibular gland, wide local excision of the sublingual gland, or in that case that we're going to look through now, uh, the, the palate, it's going to be a wide local excision with a, with a good cancer margin of a centimeter of the palate. And then we have to talk about whether you give a neck dissection or not. So the elective neck dissection, so a therapeutic neck dissection is where there is a positive nodes. And so what you're doing is you're treating it. So you, it's therapeutic. And the elective neck dissection is when there is no nodes. And then you have to decide whether the patient should get a neck dissection or not. And depending on the type of carcinoma uh, will make you decide that. And we could talk, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, a bit. Okay, all right. And that depends on what the percentage you think, what, what are the risk factors? Um, of the, the potential for it to metastasize. And here you can see a patient of mine, and I'll just run through the anatomy. Uh, so this is the internal jugular vein, all right? This is the omohyoid. This is the SCM. This is the posterior belly of digastric, yeah? And then just in the superior aspect posteriorly, coming out is the facial uh, nerve there. And the tumor was here. And then we did a neck dissection as well, which was a, um, that looks like a one to five, but usually it's a one to four. Okay. Right. So in this case, right. So this was a low grade mucor mucoepidermoid carcinoma that we had in the, uh, we decided that's what it was on the, on the core biopsy. So what I decided after discussion at the MDT, we staged her. So she had a CT maxilla to look at the bone and there was no bony erosion on the scan, okay? She had an MRI, which showed no cervical lymphadenopathy. She had an ultrasound of the neck, which showed no cervical lymphadenopathy. So this was effectively, I would say, staged as a T1 stroke T2 uh, salivary gland tumor, a low-grade polymorphous adenocarcinoma. Okay. Um, it's a bit early for Zohar, but anyway. Uh, so, yeah. And so what we decided was, look at the principles, that she needed a wide local excision of the tumor. Now, with a polymorphous low grade, just so you know, the chances of getting a neck met is actually quite slim. It's between 9 to 12%. And they say that the 20% are cut off. But anyway, there's nuances. Now, she needed uh, um, reconstruction. Right, so I decided on this lady that I would do a, a double paddle radio forearm flap because I wanted to get the soft palate lining and also the external palate lining. Uh, and so what we did was we did a, we had to do a neck incision. So when I do a neck incision, then what I did was I did a neck dissection, and then from the neck dissection I would use the vessels to anastomose. But normally in a polymorphous low grade, uh, I, I wouldn't tend to normally do a neck dissection. Okay, all right. Now. Here, I think this is a quite crucial point. Neck dissection is recommended in all cases of malignant protid, except very small, low-grade, completely excised tumors, okay? So this would be a small T1, T2, low-grade tumor, so possibly not offer a neck dissection, all right? Okay? So we'll, we'll get, don't worry about this, we'll get back to this case, all right? So uh, we'll be discussing it. So I just want to do an overview of what we decided, all right? So what we decided was that we would do this, all the tests, and then we decide whether it was benign or malignant. And depending on the malignant or sort of the nature, we would do go that way or that way. And then after that, we would think about doing adjuvant radiotherapy and then end up clinical follow. Okay. So that's the protocol. Now, adjuvant radiotherapy is very important. And the reason what they tend to use is something called protein beam therapy. All right is the most commonly used, but you can use, also use carbon ion therapy. And this is a plan of one of my uh, colleagues, Dr. Chu, who's, a, who's my oncologist. And this is a protein beam of the left parotid. And this is like what, how they plan it. It's very, very, very um, sort of software kind of engineered to try and reduce the dose 
and the adjacent structures to minimize you know um, the side effects all right now i would say and you can agree or disagree with me that most salivary gland tumors are sur it's a surgical disease okay they don't tend to respond too well to any form of chemo or radiotherapy radiotherapy is there to for so like the t3 t4 so high stage disease but also if you think about the facial nerve and if you think about some of the anatomy you may get a microscopic yeah and even macroscopic disease left behind and that's where the radiotherapy could try to reduce the risk of local recurrence, all right? Um, and in some tumors, yeah, you would, like adenocystic, for example, you would definitely give radiotherapy. And it does have a role to play, but it's not the primary role, okay? And we could talk about this later as well. There's lots to come. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Um, when you're doing pleomorphic adenomas, they can come back. And there's always this thing about why do pleomorphic adenomas come back? And I think the theory is that they've got thin pseudo capsules. Sometimes you get tumor spillage, even with a superficial or a partial protodectomy. And sometimes you don't remove all of it, okay? If, the, if it does come back, if it's a very small piece, small, small one, we could do a small extra capsule dissection, but sometimes we do radiotherapy as well, all right? Okay? Um, and we'll talk about this lady again when we get there. So let's talk about that first patient. So this was the patient, polymorphous low grade. I did a wide local excision. I took some teeth out as well, okay, just to make things easier. And then she had this as the inside lining facing the other way. And then this is the palate, okay? And there's the radial artery, all right? And so did, I did microvascular anastomosis. And this is what she looked like immediately post-op uh, while we were waking her up. You can see it's a little bit, you know. And then this is her a, a week later. Can we get the uh, sound on the video, please? So, um, like, hi everyone. So, uh, this is Maureen, uh, one of my patients. Um, she's about eight days post-op. Um, she had a, uh, a tumor of a palate excise, which we I've discussed just before the last slide, and who's going to have a ch chat with us. So, Maureen, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling all right. Yeah. 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 yeah good. 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 Um, so I know it's been a week. Uh, uh, how do you feel about your voice? It's it's good. More than expected, you know, yeah. Not more than expected. In fact, I think it was two days, a couple of days after the op, the speech therapist came. Yeah. And after you know having a little chat with me, she was like, "Oh, there you go. I don't even need to write anything down. You know, I don't need my notes and all of that." Which was a sign that you know was on the positive side more than what she had expected. Oh, that's good. Okay, well, I'm glad glad to hear that. Right. Yeah. Um. So that's thank you, thank you so much for letting the audience um, see how you're doing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> okay. So that was she's gone home. Now, just to fill in the story, she had clear margins, but she did have bony invasion through the palate, even though the CT scan didn't show it, which is fine because the rest is air, respiratory epithelium, so it's good margin. She had three positive nodes, okay, with no ECS. So you wouldn't think that in a low-grade polymorphous, and I wouldn't have given her an extra section, but it just goes to show you, we don't actually truly know. So she had three positive nodes, and so she's going to have radiotherapy uh, in the primary site and also in the neck as well. Uh, so that will be probably next week. So um, just, yeah, she only did it last week, I think, or a week before, before I came here. Okay, so it's going to talk about a couple of interesting cases before we go on to the next bit of the lecture. And there's things like, you know, difficult cases. So you can hear, you can see here, this is a, in the parapharyngeal space. I won't bore you with the anatomy, but the gist of it is you can see how there's a huge tumor. Okay, right. Now, how do you approach that? Yeah, how, what do you do? You know, it's really, 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 really massive. And so the, the way I tend to do it, this is one of my cases, is I do a, a ramus osteotomy. Okay, and then and anteriorly uh, in front of the nerve, symphysal osteotomy. And what I do just for the, some of the residents is I pre-drill the plates and screws, screw it all in, okay, take it off, then make the cuts. So then it makes it easy for me to fit the jigsaw in at the end, okay? And so once you've done that bit, all right, the next bit is to lift it all up. And here you can see the mandible has been lifted, okay? And there's your digastric, all right? 
there's your submandibular gland moved forward, and there's the tumor in its entirety just waiting to be taken out. All right, and that's the SCM. Okay, so that's a nice way to approach those kind of tumors. Now, having a ramus osteotomy and having a symphysal osteotomy is obviously has got morbidity, right? I mean, you could damage teeth, uh, it's occlusion, it's a soft diet. Um, and so what you can do sometimes if the tumors are small is you don't actually have to do ramus osteotomy. You can just remove it without doing that. And this is a case where you've got a, a slightly smaller tumor and the option was to do a single osteotomy and then lift the mandible or do double if we couldn't, but th that was, those were the backup plan. But the simple, this was a pleomorphic adenoma, but the simple plan was just to try and lift the jaw without doing an osteotomy to see if you can approach it while taking the stylo process away. So here you can see that. Oh, sorry, can you put the sound? No. Oh. We'll have to go back. Sound, for, yeah, ready? Back approach and here, can you see the tumor there? There's the stylo process, slightly bent. Uh, and there's the digastric, and there's the facial artery. If you can see the facial artery, you can see the digastric. This is a mandibular gland. Just tie off the and, and the mandible is being taken up. And then you can see that the tumor is just there, uh, just going there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to dissect this off. Uh, I have to find these cases for this lecture, guys. You know, I've worked hard, right? Um, so, okay. Right. So moving on. What we're going to talk about now is the facial nerve, all right? So what do we do? when we have tumors, malignant tumors of the facial nerve, you know, do we preserve, do we resect, and then how do we reconstruct? So that's kind of the next phase of it and, and some of the key points, okay? So as, as we talked about, you know, the parotid gland is essentially divided by the facial nerve, okay? So the facial nerve divides the superficial lobe and the deep lobe. So whenever we do um, surgery of, uh, of this area, this nerve, is paramount. I mean, it provides function to close your eyes, to make you smile, to, you know, facial expression. Um, and so this is always, always the challenge when we come to do these kind of tumors, all right? And as we talked about with the diagnostic evaluation, so first of all, you can get really, really cool CTs, 3T MRIs to look at the nerve. So MRI and CT can help, MRI can help but only by saying that if it's, you know, um, a deep low superficial lobe, you can get, so modern MRIs, and if a, if a radiologist is very, very keen, you can trace the nerve to give you a rough idea where the ner nerve is. And in terms of like preoperatively, you know, you do clinical examination, but if you really want to be sure if the nerve is involved, you can do EMGs uh, uh, where you look at the, 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 the speed of the nerve, you know, on the facial expression. So just get a more... Um, a subtle understanding of whether the nerve's been compressed or the nerve's been affected. Um, and there are different scales that you could use just to fully assess the nerve, right? Um, and so, interestingly, um, what they say, the stats are, and this is a, a recent paper, about 40%, 12 to 40% of parotid cancers involve, you know, involve facial nerve infiltration, but a high rate uh, of nerve sacrifice. So what they're, what they're saying is that we tend to sacrifice more nerves than we need to is the gist of, 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 of what, what people think. And are we, are we over-treating, okay? Um, I, I mean, it's a really, I think if you're, if you're doing this kind of surgery, it's a really, really difficult thing to decide when you're, um, when you're doing this kind of surgery because the facial nerve has a huge impact on the pa patient's life. And you're very, very much concerned about, you know, about the morbidity associated with it. And it's always difficult to make decisions, okay? Um, this is the first part of my slide, which essentially goes through this phase of you've staged everything. I think the most important thing from, like, I don't know, doing this for a very long time is you really try to get a diagnosis before you operate on the patient because it gives you a little bit more room to maneuver when you know that it's malignant pathology. Because when you have an ultrasound that's not sure, and when you open up the tumor, you can obviously see it's malignant, but you don't know if it's adenoid cystic, you don't know if it's a microepidermoid, and if you don't know it's an adenocarcinoma or low grade or high grade, et cetera. And so I think the, 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 some of the lessons are, you really, really, really confirm the, what type of malignancy it is, okay? Now, obviously, 
preoperatively if the facial nerve is involved, right? So then you know that it's uh, it's likely that you may end up sacrificing some of the branches of the facial nerve, all right? Plus or minus a nectar section. And then we can talk about the reconstruction at the next bit of this lecture. So you know that you've got malignant pathology. You know that the facial nerve is involved beforehand. And so in your consent process, you're going to tell the patient, look, your nerves are going to get much better. Uh, we may end up sacrificing some of the nerves and your face may look worse or better than that. And then you'll have contingency plan. You may think about nerve graft. Or you may think about a, a platinum or a gold weight, you know, you, you, or a dynamic or static sling. So you'll have these things planned, but you know that's what you're going to do. Now, the problem is here, and I've been caught out a few times myself, right, where, you know, um, you have no nerve involvement and you proceed to protodectomy and then, you know, intraoperatively, you have nerve involvement or what you think is nerve involvement, all right? Now, you've got the diagnosis, remember? So it's an adenoid cystic and the nerve is involved. It's going to be involved. But you've got the diagnosis. It's a low-grade mucoepidermoid and the, intraoperatively, the nerve is being surrounded by the tumor, okay? Now, what do you do? Because it's unlikely that the, you know, it's unlikely that the, the nerve has been infiltrated, but you can't resect the tumor with everything around it. And that's where, you know, what do you do? Do you sacrifice or do you spare the facial nerve? All right. And what's the right thing? All right. And I guess it's something, it's still up for debate, but we'll discuss it. Right. Now, when you're not sure, right, it says here, repeat ultrasound and core before you go. And if you still don't get confirmation of malignancy, then this is the problem. You're stuck, and I've been there myself, where I don't have a diagnosis, and I've got the facial nerve, and the tumor is infiltrating the facial nerve, it's going to deep lobe, it's going into the masseter, and, and this is where you really, really will have to consider not sacrificing the facial nerve, bailing, removing macroscopic disease, and then live to fight another day, and then consent the patient for a facial nerve sacrifice, you know, um, if that's the case. All right. So that's kind of the decision-making process, but we're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail as we go through. Okay. Um, let's just go to that bit. All right. So, so indications, uh, this is, I, I want to play this video. This is me actually cutting a facial nerve. I've got one second slice of it. It's very depressing when you have to do this guys, but there you go. It takes one second. Yeah. But to do something so drastic. Um, so indications for resection. All right. So pre preoperative facial paralysis or image suggesting direct tumor infiltration. You're never going to get that. Hardly ever. Okay. Or when you do frozen, you've got positive nerve involvement during surgery. Frozen's are notoriously unreliable. You can't always rely on it. My pathologists don't swear by it. So it's always a, a funny one. Okay. Um, radical. Okay. So what, 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 you, what you can do is, if you do do the nerve, so if you do remove the nerve, okay, then you've got to think about reconstructive options, all right? Um, and then you have to think about whether you're going to do it immediately or uh, to maintain the function, or you're going to do it later, all right? And so is this challenge is this, okay? It's a delicate balance between complete tumor removal and preserving as much of the envelope nerve as possible, all right? Um, and it's really difficult. I think it's a difficult, um, you know, to decide sometimes. And it depends on lots of things, and we're going to talk about it in a second. And this is what it depends on. So it depends on, yeah? So duration, decision to sacrifice the nerve, okay? Consider preoperatively, all right? Patient's desire, you know, age, life expectancy. Um, you know, can you get, can, do you have a early involvement in physiotherapy, salt, ophthalmology? You know, all of these things are really, really important. We don't always plan for this. So I'm sure, I don't know, the surgeons amongst you will take a tumor that's low grade and you'll go into surgery and you have no, you've told the patient everything will be fine, right? And you've not consented. You've said there's a risk of facial nerve weakness, right? Obviously, um, but that's transient and the permanent risk is like one to 2% or 1.8%. You're not going to tell them it's like 100%. And then you're in surgery and it's difficult to make a decision, okay? Because their patient's not expecting it, right? So I think that what we tend to do is, um, is, is you can consider, and this is what I consider is, 
if I've consented the patient for a, for a, you know, um, a facial nerve sacrifice, then you've got a few options, all right? So the first option is, if like the previous case, you, you've got the facial nerve stump, then you can do a couple of things. You can do a nerve graft, straightforward nerve graft. So you can use a sorrel nerve, or you can use the greater auricular nerve. So you can raise the sorrel nerve, or you can use a greater auricular nerve, and you can connect uh, for the facial nerve stump to a branch of the frontal uh, and, and the buckle. Yeah, so you get the eyes closed, get the smile going, all right? And that way, when they smile, when they close their eyes, they will smile and they will close their eyes. Now, neuroplasticity is something that you can't predict, all right? So in younger patients, they tend to do better than older patients, and we know that, right? And so in older patients, you may consider other options, like maybe afterwards think about doing a platinum weight or gold weight because the, the nerve graft, you know, may not take. But that's the first thing, you know, think about doing um, um, a, a nerve graft, okay, primary nerve graft. The other thing is if there's a lot of skin involvement, so if you, when you do the surgery, you know you're going to take a lot of skin and you're going to do radical proctorectomy, that's when you could think about doing uh, free flaps. So possibly you can do um, an AOT flap with the, with the nerve, with the, with, the, with, the, with the lateral nerve, and you can basically use that as a vascularized nerve graft. Because these patients, if you're going to do radical proctorectomy, will invariably end up having radiotherapy. So that's another way of looking, look, 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 looking at it, all right? Um, as I said, it's, it's a really, really, really difficult, um, you know, a problem to solve. Now, the problem is sometimes the tumor extends to the mastoid process, and then you, I, I usually need my ENT colleagues to open the mastoid up, um, and then you can't find the facial nerve stump. So what do you do in that scenario? So you've resected the tumor, but you don't have a facial nerve stump. And that's when you could use... Um, uh, what they call is like you 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 power it you you supercharge it so there's two options that i use so this is one of my cases where i've used a nerve to masseter so just in the same bed you've got the masseter muscle and you've got the nerve to masseter and then you can take that nerve and then do a graft to the the the, the, the buccal branch of the distal branch and that way when they clench their teeth they'll smile it's not ideal so it's not like when you smile you smile it's like you have to you have to clench your teeth to smile. So it's not, the other one you can do is a hypoglossal uh, jump graft. So from the hypoglossal nerve, you can basically uh, connect a nerve up to here. And what you do is you just do end to side anastomosis and then an end to end anastomosis, and then you can do a jump graft. So there's, there's a couple of things that you can do. This is, this is all immediate. This is not afterwards. This is not six months later, a year later. This is at the time of surgery, you, you know, you're thinking you've got the facial nerve stump, so you can do a simple nerve graft. You don't have the facial nerve stump, then you have to think about using a jump graft, such as a nerve to masseter or a hypoglossal nerve. And obviously, if you've got um, a tissue replacement, then you can use something like a gracilis or an AOT with a nerve, and then you can do a vascularized nerve graft with the skin as well, all right? So I've tried to make it as simple as I can. So with, with the nerve, oops, yeah. So with this, nerve graft is very simple. You can just do um, the epinerium to epinerium. So here's me doing a case. Uh, just that, and then just put a bit of tissue glue. And all you've got to do is do a tension-free closure, which approximates the tissues nearby. There's nothing amazing about it. And the most important things are rehab, okay? So you really need physiotherapy, early physiotherapy. You need to, you know, restore the symmetry. Eye closure is really, really important. And there's also things like botulinum toxin as well. So there's a lot of, like, um, I, I don't do facial reanimation and I don't work in a, a unit that does this. So we tend to refer late cases to another unit to do because it's not my current practice. But as a head and neck surgeon, as a head and neck reconstructive surgeon, you have to have certain skill sets when you're dealing with malignant pathology. You can't just remove the tumor and not think about the reconstruction or the rehabilitation. And, and doing a, a nerve graft or doing a, a, you know, a, a vascularized or non-vascularized nerve graft or using a jump graft is something that we should be able to do or, or at least think about because it's probably the giving the patient the best uh, outcome. And then um, after this, you can refer them on, um, et cetera, et cetera. Some people may ask questions about, oh, what about like using a gracilis for muscle and all that, and or using a crossover graft from the other side. There's loads and loads of techniques. The thing is, what I'm trying to explain is the bit where you're, you're acutely doing a case. So the muscle has not atrophied. You don't need muscle. 
you just need innovation to the muscle and you've just denervated the muscle. And that's where these, you know, one or three or four or five things that you can do is, you know, really comes into play. All right. So this is, so some of the issues, you know, elective resection. Okay. Um, some surgeons advocate removing the nerve. Some say, you know, you can leave microscopic, um, uh, uh, Invade or you know residual tumor, and then have the radiotherapy to do it. There's lots of arguments about when do you do the reconstruction. There's lots of arguments about advanced monitoring techniques, um, and so there's 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 lots of debate um, going on in this field. Um, but I think the key management techniques are this. Okay, um, it's it's about oncological control with functional preservation, and it's a really really fine line in that area, uh, and it's a, not an easy decision to make. I think that my, my only advice would be to, is to understand like the pathway, have some idea in your head what you would do in a given situation. And, you know, you know, obviously work in an MDT, but realize that these scenarios, you know, I'm sure some, you know, a lot of people out there just do a parotid, but there are so many more complexities and leaving a patient with a facial nerve weakness because of your, you know, your lack of knowledge or lack of skill you know, it's not fair on the patient. And I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't try to understand the concepts, okay? Um, it does involve MDT. It does involve your oncologist. It does involve your radiologist. It does involve your histopathologist, cytopathologist. So it's quite quite important. I mean, and there, there will be future nerve monitor techniques, reconstructive techniques coming along. But ultimately, you know, we, we are where we are, okay? All right, so that kind of concludes... I think I've taken a lot of time, concludes my bit of it, but I just want to do a couple of plugs, um, if I may. So um, there's further reading. So um, if anyone's interested in the um, FCC PES exam, I think, FCS, FC or PS exam, or FRCS exam. So I've written a book on um, the revision for this. So it's a really, really good book. I'm sure it's available in all good, good shops and PDFs. I'm sure it's online. I'm sure you've all had it. Um, if you're interested in microvascular surgery, I run a microvascular course every three months in London uh, using live animals. Um, so you're always welcome to come and join. Uh, but there's a book I've written on manual basic microsurgery techniques, which I really highly recommend. Um, there is uh, some a book on looking at like latest developments in AI and robotics, which I'm involved in. So if you're interested in that, there's another one. This is more about exams. And this is a, a basic introduction to the text, which is coming out next year. And the most important book is this one that I'm doing. It's almost finished. Uh, it's a collaboration with Dr. Faisal uh, and Dr. Raza and me and one of my colleagues from London. And what we what we, what we we did was I kind of, the last time I was in Shokot Hanum, I saw that, you know, not everywhere has facilities for microvascular surgery. And so this is book is just a case-based approach about maybe 50 to 60 cases. And what we take is <clears throat> oral cavity cancers, in different parts of the oral cavity, so just oral cavity cancers, and local flaps, local flaps without any microvascular surgery that anyone can do with just basic training. So things like nasolabial flaps, platysmal flaps, submental flaps, fam flaps, you know, um, temporalis flaps, um, buccal fat pad flaps, and it's like going, and lots of lip ones as well. Um, and it's going through cases where we just show pictures of, of of the cases. There's also some videos of the flaps being raised by um, international experts, such as Dr. Faisal and Dr. Raza uh, and myself. And also um, there's like a how to do as well. So it's a, inshallah, we will definitely next Shokot Hanam Symposium have signed copies by Dr. Faisal uh, as prizes. So you must attend next year. Um, and then the next thing is about, if you're interested in oral cancer, I work for AO Foundation, and we do a diploma called the Global Oral Cancer Diploma, which basically is, um, is a 10-month diploma, all online, available to all, uh, and it runs for 10 months, and it's basically trying to bring the knowledge uh, to a certain level of how you manage oral cancer because it's a growing thing in the Indo-Subcontinent and a lot of other places. So it's just to try to get you to you know, sing from the same hymn sheet. So when you think about what to offer a patient, you understand 
that you know a tongue cancer should be off the next section. You understand that you know a buccal carcinoma has a propensity to go to the facial lymph node. You there's lots of you know you understand the role of radiotherapy and how it plays an important role in oral cancer. Uh, you know and radiology. There's the, so it's it's a really really. Um, I know some of you have enrolled in the the program, but it's it's a really really good thing. I would recommend for anyone who wants to work with in the or, you know oral cancer field. So yeah, it's a little bit expensive. I have spoken to the team about making it free, but I don't think it's going to happen because of the the European uh, costs, unfortunately. So um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, and um, this is me recently doing a um, half marathon uh, with the Shokot Khanam. I did raise some money for Shokot Khanam. Uh, not much, but I did try to raise some. So if you want to follow me uh, on Instagram, it's Head and Neck Surgery. Uh, I'm available on YouTube and also this is my email if you have any uh, any other questions. Jazakallah khairan. Okay. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent talk. So we'll keep the questions uh, for the end of the session. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sami Ula. Dr. Sami is our consultant, plastic and reconstructive surgery. Uh, he's been with us for many years now. He's been trained in Aya Khan and QE. Uh, Sami, uh, he's talking about uh, pre tissue transfer in vessel depleted neck. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. Or oh, in fact, it's a good noon now, I think. <laughs> So um, my name is Dr. Sami. I'm a consultant plastic and reconstructive surgeon working at Shokat Khan Memorial Cancer Hospital, Peshawar. Uh, it's always very really difficult to, you know, follow uh, a very good speaker like Abdul Ahmed, uh, uh, such a comprehensive talk. So um, my talk is a little bit more precise, um, and uh, I hope I will not take a lot of your time. Um, a little disclaimer, so this uh, talk was supposed to be given by my supervisor, Dr. Fazlur Rahman, who works at uh, Aachan University Hospital, Karachi, as a consultant plastic surgeon. But due to some unforeseen circumstances, he was not able to make it. So, uh, you know, the organizing committee asked me to present. And so here I am presenting it. Um, so uh, vessel depleted neck, uh, it's an uncommon occurrence, uh, uh, in fact, a rare occurrence. Uh, as a plastic surgeons, we do get uh, cases wherein um, there are the soft tissues of the neck uh, are so depleted, are so scarred uh, that you cannot find appropriate vessels uh, for uh, anastomosis in case of free tissue transfers. Uh, so as I said, uh, um, sometimes we do case, uh, get cases wherein the soft tissues of the neck are severely fibrosed, the scarred, and that's because of previous radio radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and, and previously operated patients. So uh, while working in Shokat Hanam Hospital, and when, last night when I was going through the presentation, uh, and when I got to this slide, Necessary Evil, I just Google it and see as to what it means, actually. So a necessary evil is uh, an evil which someone believes needs to be done uh, or accepted uh, because it is necessary to achieve a good outcome. Um, uh, especially in circumstances where alternative courses of action or inaction would lead to adverse outcome. And in Aachan University Hospital, we thought that this necessary evil is actually the ENT surgeons or the ENT surgeon because they are important for a successful outcome, but they would make our life so difficult uh, in, in you know, certain situations. So, uh, for example, this is a case... Uh, where he has got a large defect almost involving uh, in the entire left side of the face with the buccal mucosa um, and the, uh, the left side of the neck. 
So if you see, uh, there are literally no vessels available in the neck. Uh, we can only see the uh, carotid system that has been spared and even that is quite contracted or fibrosed. And if you see down at the very bottom of the neck, uh, there is a clamp that has been applied to the vessel. That's actually the internal jugular vein that has been resected with the tumor. Um, so what do we do in these situations? And we are going to talk about it uh, uh, as we go on. So this is another case, uh, a squamous cell carcinoma of the scalp, a recurrent tumor, actually a recurrent squamous cell carcinoma uh, with a bit of invasion of the skull bone. Um, and if you see the neck uh, that has been already been operated, uh, this patient had a neck dissection before as well and he received post-operative radiotherapy. So the neck is quite contracted and fibrosed as well. So um, these are some of the uh, famous plastic surgeons at uh, Karachi, and the culprit who did not made it to the symposium today is this individual, Dr. Fazlur Rahman. So uh, the case that I showed earlier, the you know the squamous cell carcinoma of the scalp. So what we did was we did a free ALT flap, um, and we plugged it into the ipsilateral neck. Uh, the artery was plugged into the lingual artery and the vein into the internal jugular veins. But 18 hours later, the flap got compromised, as you can see from the margins of the flap. Um, so we re-explored this individual. We went in again. Uh, and we took a saphenous vein graft from the leg and we went into the contralateral neck uh, for the anastomosis of the venous system. Um, and we were fortunate enough to salvage it. And this patient is, uh, and this is how he looks after, three months after the operation. So uh, contralateral neck. So this is one of the options that you can go in uh, in vessel depleted necks. Uh, it has got certain advantages. Uh, majority of the times the ipsilateral neck is the side which is affected by the disease. So the, the contralateral side is literally untouched and there are good virgin vessels that you can find in to plug your vessels into. On the contrary, however, uh, in order to reach the contralateral side, obviously you will need a long pedicle length on your flaps to reach the contralateral side. Um, and thinking of uh, another recurrence in these individuals, because uh, these are usually, these situations happen in recurrent tumors. So if there is another recurrence, uh, then you won't have the option of the contralateral available, uh, contral neck, contralateral neck available to plug your vessels into. And obviously, because you need a saphenous vein graft to reach the contralateral side, so uh, you would need to do a double anastomosis. Uh, um, and uh, as the number of anastomosis increases, the risk of failures or the free flaps increases. So um, this is just a slide just to show as to how uh, you can approach the contralateral neck. So, so you always need uh, lengths on your pedicle. So if you're going to the contralateral neck, uh, you need to dissect your vessels as far distal or as superior as possible. Uh, the facial artery is usually uh, dissected close to the angle of the mandible, and then you sort of dissect it down as well to its origin, and then that leads to push potential increase in the length of the facial artery, and then you just flip it to the other side. Um, uh, just to increase the length on the on on your uh, vessel recipient vessels. Similarly, um, you can dissect the EJV as well as far as superior as possible um, to gain length on it, and then you can you can flip it uh, towards the ipsilateral side. Uh, that would reduce the length of pedicle, uh, the pedi uh, length of your vessels on your uh, on your flap uh, for the anastomosis. So this is another individual. He had a recurrent SCC, squamous cell carcinoma of the buccal mucosa. Um, he was uh, ha he has had neck dissection as well as post-operative radiotherapy. Came with this recurrence. Uh, we did it as a combined case with the uh, head and neck surgeon, obviously the ENT surgeons at Aachen Khan University Hospital. Um, the resection involved, as you can see, um, almost entire of 
the left side of the face, the buccal mucosa, as you can see, uh, marginal mandibulectomy has been done as well. The mandible is completely exposed. Um, and we went to the contralateral side uh, to anastomosa vessels into, obviously this uh, probably uh, is um, not probably a great outcome, but uh, uh, the, the aim in these individuals is to achieve uh, wound coverage uh, uh, for them to have uh, some sort of uh, life. So uh, in vessel depleted necks, um, majority of the time, the issue is the venous system. Uh, that is purely because the veins are usually um, thin walled uh, and they are easily involved by the uh, tumor process. Um, so in, in these cases uh, where they have got previous radiation and surgery, uh, according to this um, study, uh, there is absence of IJV and EGV in about 16% of the cases. So again, that same individual, and we'll see as to what we have done. Um, so if you see, so we don't, we have uh, the external carotid system available, but literally no veins available to, to plug our vessels into. Uh, the IJV has been clamped and then it was later uh, ligated as well. So hoarding it, Horning and Chen um, in 1993 described what is called a lifeboat technique. Uh, so what it actually means is that they used the cephalic vein uh, for the uh, um, venous drainage uh, of the flap. So what they do is that they dissect the cephalic vein. Um, uh, it usually lies uh, in the deltopectoral groove. So this is the deltoid muscle uh, the pec major muscle and the cephalic vein runs um, in this deltopectoral groove and uh, distally in the arm it runs in the bicipital groove. So, so this is how it has been dis uh, dissected. So what we do, we make an incision on the in the deltopectoral groove. We go through the skin, the underlying fat and the deep fascia, uh, go and find out the deltopectoral groove and dissect the vessel out of it. And this is how it looks. So going back again, so um, once you have found your uh, cephalic vein, we just literally cut it distally uh, and flip it towards the neck so that we can plug our vessels uh, into it. Uh, so, and the pivot point is usually where it pierces uh, the clavipectoral fascia or the costochorocyte membrane where it ends into the subclavian vein. So, so it, you you cut it distally, you flip it towards, uh, dissect it out, and then you know pivot it uh, at the uh, clavipectoral fascia or costochorocyte membrane and uh, bring it to the towards the neck. Same individual again, and so we did a very large ALT. Um, uh, it was plugged. The arterial system was plugged into the external carotid system, and then the uh, cephalic vein was used for the venous drainage. Uh, there's another individual in which uh, uh, the cephalic vein was used as well. So the advantages of uh, cephalic using the cephalic vein as a venous drainage system, um, since it avoids the use of uh, uh, venous graft, so you tend to have one anastomosis in instead of double anastomosis. Um, you can take as much length as possible. Uh, you can go as far distal as possible in the arm to achieve length on your cephalic vein for it to reach uh, towards the pedicle of your flap. It usually has uh, a good diameter, and we have seen it, uh, you know, while harvesting the radial forearm flap. Uh, it's, it's commonly used in that as well. Um, and it's more distal in the forearm while harvesting the uh, radial forearm flap. So in the arm, it has got a very good diameter, about 2 to 2.5 millimeter. Um, it's a high flow and low pressure system, again, very useful for the free tissue transfers. Um, and usually it is outside the surgical field, uh, field of uh, operation and field of radiotherapy. Um, some personal thoughts uh, by Dr. Fazel. So um, according to him, um, 
the vessel usually gets smaller as you go distally in the arm. Um, you have, there, there are two ways to take it to the neck. Either you go posterior to the clavicle or you go uh, anterior to it. Uh, the, uh, he prefers the, uh, to be taken it anterior to the clavicle uh, because it's, sometimes it's very difficult to dissect uh, posterior to the clavicle. And then the, there is a risk of pneumothorax as well. Uh, he sometimes make a small groove in the clavicle because there is very deficient soft tissues uh, over the clavicle. And once you close the skin on top, it can actually compress the vein. So he tends to make a groove in the clavicle. Um, and then he does, he sort of does not rotate it 180 degrees. He tries to make a circle out of it so as that the vein does not kink um, uh, later on. And this was published um, uh, back in 2020 in uh, eplasty. So the other options, uh, the EJV can be used as a vein graft because um, uh, it's in the same operative field. You just have to take it out from the neck uh, if it's available. Uh, and uh, you can plug it proximally to the uh, vein of the flap and distally uh, to the uh, uh, whatever vein is available uh, or uh, if, if you do not get length on the cephalic vein. And obviously you can go to the contralateral neck. So now coming to the arterial options, there are various options that are available in vessel depleted necks. Uh, that includes the transverse cervical artery, the thoracoacromial artery and the internal memory artery. And uh, we'll, I'll explain it one by one. So this is just a pictorial representation. The transverse cervical artery, it comes off the thyrocervical trunk, which is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery. Uh, and then you've got the internal memory vessel or internal memory artery, uh, which again is coming from the first part of the subclavian artery. Um, and then the thoracoacromial artery, which comes from the second part of the axillary artery. So transverse cervical artery uh, has got a very good caliber, 2.65 millimeter. You can um, achieve a length of uh, about four to seven centimeters on it. Um, the disadvantage is that it is usually not accompanied uh, by the vein, or if it is, uh, the vein is very thin and uh, cannot be used for anastomosis. Uh, and in about 15% uh, of the cases, it is usually, it is not present. So there's another lady, a large, very large tumor uh, on the right side of the face. Um, again, it was discussed in MDT. Uh, they had, uh, booked up a surgical assessment. Uh, the NT surgeon excised the tumor, huge defect um, involving the uh, half of the palate. Uh, almost half of, uh, right side of the face, uh, marginal mandibulectomy. Um, so the transverse cervical artery was used in this case because uh, if you see there is a suture that has been applied to the external carotid artery. Um, and when our boss used to see a suture, and this is a silk suture, by the way, uh, on a vessel, he would not use it for anastomosis because he thought that there is a higher risk of uh, thrombosis uh, in these uh, in these vessels. So the transverse cervical artery, it is usually found. Uh, so the way to dissect it is that you uh, uh, you can find it in the posterior triangle. Um, it lies on the anterior scalene muscle. Uh, so once you find it uh, in the posterior triangle, uh, deep down, in, you know, inferior. Uh, part of the posterior triangle. We just, just dissect it out towards its uh, origin. Um, so this is again the uh, transverse cervical artery that has been shown. And this is how it looks postoperatively. Thoracoacromial artery, um, as I said, it comes from the uh, second. Uh, uh, it comes from the second part of the axillary artery. Um, it is usually accompanied by the cephalic vein. So, as you dissect the cephalic vein in the deltopectoral groove, uh, you find it. Uh, you you retract the uh, deltoid muscle laterally and the pec major muscle inferiorly and medially, and I just you look for thoracal. Th the thoracoacromial artery, you just dissect it to, towards its origin. 
uh, internal memory vessels uh, commonly used for, for reconstruction in breast uh, in breast reconstructions. It's uh, found um, adjacent to the um, sternum uh, behind the costal cartilages. The way to dissect it is that you just remove the second costal cartilage. Um, you open up the deep fascia you, uh, and uh, the, the artery utilized lateral to the vein. Uh, you just dissect it out from there uh, and then it can be used. So um, this is how it has. So this is the rib. The costal cartilage has already been uh, removed and these are the internal memory vessels. Correlate loop, that's uh, another option um, in these situations. So what they do is um, they uh, create uh, a temporary uh, arteriovenous fistula, uh, taking the cephalic vein distally, uh, cutting it distally, flip it towards the contralateral side and plug it into the external carotid vessel. And then uh, the cephalic vein is cut at appropriate length uh, for it to be used both for the artery um, uh, and the vein. So um, just a little data, uh, uh, they did uh, about two 11 free flaps. 20 of them had a vessel depleted neck. Uh, they had three failures. Um, and the conclusion is uh, better to go outside the operated field, uh, the irradiated field. Cephalic vein is an option, uh, as well as the transverse cervical and going into the contralateral side. And uh, this is me standing with him. Fortunately, I've joined the ranks of the consultant now. Uh, this is Hamza, who has joined us as a senior instructor now, a FIFA, who is our fellow uh, at Shogat Khanam Lahore. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. Uh, so remember, this was the data from Ahan. This is not Sami's data. And they're very fond of doing tracheostomy in every uh, surgical resection. So uh, the next is line is uh, Dr. Arif Jamshed, uh, our teacher, uh, the consultant radiation oncologist. He's going to talk about the net nodal station concept. Dr. Arif. Good morning, and uh, thanks very much, Faisal, for inviting me this morning. Uh, although the symposium program was out for a year, but obviously we get shocking news uh, every year. So just before the start of the session, I'm asked to give a lecture. So I didn't know what to do. So uh, I just pulled out a few slides and brought them here. I think rather than giving a textbook lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a few out of you, uh, Akil. Are you the, let's have it. Uh, have you got any volunteers or should I, uh, what you call, pick myself? It will be easier if you raise your hands and I can call you now. Yasser, you don't want an eye contact? Come over here, have a seat. You're a consultant now. Right, who else is here? Danny, you want to join in here? So we've got our panel as well. So let me introduce the panel for you. Danny is a third year resident. Uh, Yasser is consultant in Peshawar. Akil is one of our bright fellows. So we'll, I'll be asking you questions and you can tell me. So, I mean, uh, if you become, want to become a master of head and neck, that wherever you go, people listen to you, what is one thing that you need to know? Is there anything which you need to know to become a master? You need to have a very clear understanding of how you're going to manage the neck. Treating the primary is the easy part. What do, what do you do with the primary? You just try to excise it with a clear margin, and that's the end of it. But your problem comes what you do with the neck, irrespective of whichever tumor, whichever site, it is the neck which tells you, and it will differentiate a good oncologist from an average one or an oncologist who doesn't understand what you have to do with the neck. And if you look how the treatment has evolved over the last uh, 100 years, is basically now you have become selective in terms of what you treat. Selective is the what you call keyword now, whether it is radiotherapy, whether it is surgery, it is selective treatment. If you're going to do selective treatment, what is one thing that you need to know? You can only do selective treatment if you have an understanding of 
if you have an understanding of ants chup kar ke baithe ho so ants what do you need to know you need to have an understanding of the neck now when you go to medical college you are taught about the neck nodes that you got nodes in the neck and they are all what you call distributed in the form of chains as such so i think we should also start seeing some of the slides as well so before we come to all that so which is the single most important prognostic factor in head and neck cancer is it the size is it the margin positivity is it nodal spread or tumor grade all of you should get it correct so the correct answer is c and the importance of neck nodal metastasis is i think more clearly you cannot have a slide which more clearly illustrates the importance of why it is so important that you should have an understanding of the neck if you have for example a t1 and not tongue cancer and somebody asks you what the survival is what is the survival of a t1 and not tongue cancer anyone 80 to 90%. So if one node is positive, what is the survival then? It comes down to 40 to 50%. And if you have extra nodal extension, what will happen then? So if you have a, what you call node positivity, it will immediately reduce your survival to 50%. And extra nodal extension will further reduce it again to 50%. So someone with a T1 and not tongue cancer who has a survival of 90%, and all of a sudden you find that one node is positive his survival from 90 will come down to something like 45 to 50 and if there is extra nodal extension that 50 will be reduced to 20 to 25% so the importance of knowing what to do in that situation is again dependent on your understanding of the neck as such so the neck nodal station concept, the concept itself is fairly simple in a sense that it allows you to study the patterns of nodal spread. You can have just saying that neck is positive doesn't mean anything in terms of when it comes to treating that patient. You need to be able to tell okay, which portion of the neck is actually involved. And you have got what you call this jugular node, which is along your internal jugular vein, and then the facial node, it's the technical sites, which how you name them. If you look at your teaching in anatomy or Gray's anatomy, there is no such thing as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What they do is that they name the nodes according to the location where they are actually situated so a node which is close to your occipital bone will be called as occipital node a node which is on the face is called as buccofacial node a node which is in the submandibular region will be called as submandibular node nodes along your jugular vein will be called as jugular nodes so when it comes to treating those patients those that nomenclature and that terminology is of very little use or very little help for the treating clinician. Because jugular vein nodes start from the skull base and come down to the clavicle. So which portion of those nodes are you going to do if you're going to do selective treatment as such? And then for your treatment, you've got selective treatment both in surgery as well as radiotherapy. In surgery, you used to do the radical neck dissection. That radical dissection modified into modified neck dissection. And that modified has now further refined into selective neck dissection. And those can only be done if you know what your patterns of spread are. So patterns of spread, if you want to study that, then you again come to the concept of neck nodal stations. So roughly there are about 300 nodes in the neck and all these nodes are arranged in the form of chains. So the concept is simply dividing this change into segments. Once you divide the chain into segments, then you can number them. So I'll come back to the slide in a minute, but basically there are three systems of neck nodal system, what you call uh, the nodal station systems. The surgeons, if you go to an MDT, surgeon has his own definition of neck nodal stations. The radiologist has his own definition of where these neck nodes are. And on top of it, the radiation oncologists have their own. But for practical purposes, there is quite a lot of overlap between all three of them. 
Surgeons use what you call what they can see at the time of surgery. So they have divided the neck into one, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to talk about the others. If you want to go into detail, you need a lecture as long as Professor Emmert's, probably three times the length of that lecture to cover that. So I'm not going to waste too much time over here. But all of you are familiar with it. I'll just tell you what the surgeons do. They look for things which they can actually identify at the time of surgery. They can identify the skull base. They can identify the stylohyoid muscle. They can identify the hyoid bone. And they can identify the accessory nerve. So they use those markers for dividing these neck into different segments, which are one, two, three, four, and five. The radiologists, on the other hand, look for their axial CT slices. What they can see on the axial CT slices, they tend to divide according to that. Whereas for radiation oncologists, we tend to, what you call again, rely on CT, but we tend to pick out those things which are also clinically relevant. There are two papers which are important. Those are both consensus guidelines. The first one was in 2004, and then the next one was in 2030. And based on those, what you call uh, papers, we have been able as radiation oncologists to define our own uh, segments because this is what we use when we do your conformal planning. So I'm going to give you an example over here. This is not a comprehensive view of how this concept of nodal stations is brought into practice as such. So you can pick out any case and then you can work out in the same fashion as I'm going to illustrate in this case. And that hopefully will do my 15 minutes and I should finish within my 15 minutes. So he is a 55 year old male and he has a one by one centimeter. How do you work this laser? We can't. But anyway, you can clearly see he has got a small lesion on his uh, lateral border of the tongue. The depth of invasion is five millimeter. The histology is poorly differentiated and the neck is clinically negative. The top one. Mm. This is the first time I've seen a pointer like this one. Anyway. So there you go. So what is this clinical stage? What is the stage in this patient? Just looking at it, his neck is negative. He is T1, N0, uh, at least on the, what you call, what you're seeing over here, this patient is T1, N0. One question for you, a simple one again. Can you identify occult metastasis on uh, imaging? By the word itself, occult means, if you can see it, it's no longer. So the answer is no. So if you compare different modalities in terms of which is the best one, don't go read too much into it, just look at the last line as such. That out of, if you want to see the neck nodes, the best imaging modality remains your CT scan. And if you can't see it on the CT scan, you're not likely to see it on any other imaging. In terms of what you call your specificity, the CT scan is the best one. So coming back to my patient as such, he's T1 and zero. Now, understanding of the, what kind of a treatment does this patient need? Surgery. So tongue is fairly straightforward. What you need to do on tongue is a partial glossectomy and try to get a good margin around the tumor. But the more problem area is neck. So what are you going to do with the neck? Just saying neck dissection is not good enough. You should be able to specify which portions of the neck need to be dissected. And this concept over here, you should do for all stages and all sites. If you know what you're going to do in every situation, whether for T1, what are you going to do? For T2, what are you going to do? If the tumor is involving the tip of the tongue, what are you going to do? Then you will become a master of head and neck cancer. So this is over here, it's just an example. So a patient with T1 and not, is it involving the tip of the tongue? It's not involving the tip of the tongue. So is the contralateral neck at risk? So the only risk is on the ipsilateral side. If the risk is on the ipsilateral side, what is the frequency of nodal involvement on the ipsilateral side? 
हाँ जी यस सर व्हाट इज द रिस्क 15 टू 20 परसेंट सो वेन एज द प्रोफेसर वॉज टेलिंग यू वेन द रिस्क इज इन दैट रेंज देन यू हैव टू कंसिडर ट्रीटमेंट so what levels will you be what you call considering for treatment over here for neck dissection level 1 to level 3 level 2 itself has got two portions 2a and 2b are both at risk or you just need to do 2a so i mean this is now what you call ultra selective neck dissection here you're going to treat this patient you're going to do level 1 a and b level 2 a and level 3 what about level 4 what is the risk of involvement of level 4 in this patient i mean it's variable it can be anything from 0 to 7% so those who treat it go along with the 7% and those who don't treat it go with the 0% 1 2 is must level 4 is your clinical judgment or your clinical call given this patient is poorly differentiated if it was to me i would treat his level 4 because neck failure in a tongue cancer is i mean on paper you can salvage it but half of those patients or more than half actually will die if they recur so if you want to get rid of or minimize the chance of failure within the neck then also include level 4 so in this patient you're going to do a selective treatment which is 1 a and b 2 a 3 4 optional if you do it it's fine if you don't do it it's fine as well so this is how what you call the surgical selective treatment comes into play provided you have the understanding and for that understanding you need to know what is the frequency of involvement for a particular set of node node group what is the risk of contralateral neck node involvement in this patient deni looking on other side doesn't mean that you're going to avoid what you call answering this question so what is the risk say anything you will be right it's zero nothing if your ipsilateral neck is negative hardly ever you will see a contralateral node for a well lateralized tumor i mean once in a lifetime after 35 years you may come across but for run of the mill if your ipsilateral is negative contralateral is hardly ever positive so this patient undergoes what you call uh, surgery and his final staging is say i make it now p p t1 n0 m0 will he need post operative radiotherapy no why not so extent of neck dissection we have covered in this i'll make it a little bit more difficult for you now so this is the same patient and in the same patient the pathology comes back as pt1 n3b m0 now before i discuss this i'll just go and tell you the limitations with the ajcc uh, what you call staging what is the problem with the staging when it comes to treating is there any problem over here you everybody knows if you have a single single node less than 3 cm it would be n1 if you have what you call multiple ipsilateral it will be n2 and if you have contralateral n2c and if you have a node which is more than 6 cm it would be n3 what the staging doesn't tell you is what you have to do in terms of treatment it may tell you the prognosis of the patient but it what it doesn't tell you is what how you are going to approach in terms of doing selective treatment the staging system does not help you at all in terms of how much neck needs to be treated and how it is to be treated probably when future staging revisions come that factor may be taken into account say for example for a tongue patient a neck node in level 1 has a totally different significance as compared to a level 4 node in the same patient 
although both are n1 but a node which is in n4 what you call level 4 is totally different in terms of prognosis as compared to a node it do you follow this point over here that the staging system itself although gives an indication of prognosis but it provides very little guidance in terms of what needs to be treated in a particular situation so we come back to our what you call patient now who has got N3B disease. So over here, the question is now for the radiation oncologist. Tabinda always uh, what you call complains that nobody asks radiation oncologists. This is a surgical session. We are all the time surgery. So Tabinda, as a radiation oncologist, what are you going to treat in this patient in terms of treating his neck? We don't have a mic for Tabinda, eh? She is a professor of radiation oncology. She is my teacher as well now. Very good. So when you have, uh, again, uh, don't what you call read too much into this slide. The point I'm trying to make is for you to have what you call, when you go and study head and neck, if you want to really get mastery in this subject, make out your own charts for all stages and all situations and then see, you'll find that a pattern will come. When you have someone who has got multiple nodes, his contralateral neck is already at least. So you cannot, what you call, get away in this patient without treating the contralateral neck. Now it comes to the point, which portion of contralateral are you going to treat? The neck is from the skull base to the clavicle. So are you going to treat the whole thing or are you going to pick out something which is in particular? So in this particular patient, which is again a rule of thumb, which is the areas which are at risk in the contralateral neck? So if your ipsilateral neck is positive, say in level two and three, which are the what you call areas on the contralateral side which will be positive as well? So very good. So if you have what you call disease in level two and three, it is the contralateral two and three which are at maximum risk. Because we know that tongue cancer spreads to one, two, and three most frequently. So if I'm going to treat the contralateral neck, I'll treat one, two, and three. Given this patient only had two nodes positive, so I'll probably do one, two, three, possibly four contralateral on this side and do the ipsilateral comprehensively. But say if the number of nodes on this side was five, seven, eight, then I would probably do the whole of the contralateral neck. So those are all judgment calls as such. But in simple terms, you need to know exactly, now if you look at that paper, it has got those boundaries which are difficult, but don't be what you call uh, frightened. Try to learn it because when you're going to do your planning, and you're going to do conformal planning, you need to be very clear what you're going to mark in terms of irradiating those neck. So the neck node concept itself is basically dividing the segment, the chain of neck nodes into segments. And then those segments have been named. By the way, do you know who did the naming? Who is responsible for describing the lymphatic drainage of the neck? Somebody did make an effort and describe the nodes of the neck. So who was it? He has a lymph node named in the neck after him. The node itself is very high in the neck. The guy was from France as well. The node belongs to level 7A. <laughs> Ruvier. Where is the node of Ruvier? 
No one knows. It's a, your retropharyngeal nodes are the nodes of Ruvia. So in 1932, he basically described the lymphatic chains in the neck. And the memorial were the first people who actually divided the nodes into these segments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then Jatan Shah and his work thereon took it into the 90s when it becomes, when they introduced the concept of selective neck dissection. And then Gregor brought it, the radiotherapy portions in it. Whereas the surgeons, they follow the Robbins classification of how they do it. But for practically, what you need to understand is there are the neck nodes are divided into segments. You should know what is the frequency of involvement for a different stage and different site. Once you know the frequency, it allows you to do selective treatment. Once you're able to do selective treatment, you're able to reduce morbidity. And all the future of treatment as you go on into the century forward would be going more and more conformal so as to minimize the morbidity and improve the quality of life. I think probably that what you call, I think the point I was trying to make, I think I've got through to you, that if you want to what you call get a, do optimum treatment, whether it is with radiotherapy or surgery, you must develop a understanding of the neck nodal concept, which is basically dividing the segment, the chains into segments and knowing how frequently they are involved and what the boundaries are. Thanks very much. So if you have any questions, please come forward. Uh, there's the mic here, you can ask question. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, a uh, few questions from my side. Uh, so there was this paper that was published from Vienna, uh, one of my professors, Bob, and he was working on extracapsular dissection versus uh, superficial proteodectomy. So, uh, and his paper was more inclined towards superficial proteodectomy because of the risk of recurrence, um, permanent facial nerve paralysis, uh, and, uh, you know, the positive margin. I just want your thoughts on that. Yeah, yes, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so there's been lots of studies. The major one is the Christie studies in Manchester, and they, they proved that the risk of recurrence is the same as a superficial proteodectomy. Um, and so that's the first thing. In terms of the permanent nerve damage, it's exactly the same. The transient is more in superficial parotid versus ECD because you obviously have to dissect the nerve out. Um, and finally... Um, so what was the other point, last bit, about... So the risk of recurrence. Is the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say the risk of recurrence is the same. And temp uh, permanent is the, is, is the same as well. So I think, you know, um, in some... I, I, it depends on your training. So what, what you'll find is some surgeons will always offer superficial proteodectomy because they've not been trained to do ECD. I think the ECD has a, a place... In, in your armamentarium. It's not the BN and endor, but it's definitely something that I tend to tr uh, train my trainees. Okay. Thanks. And about the micro versus macroscopic disease, um, I want both of you to answer that question. So if you are uh, treating a malignant tumor um, and the important, there's an importance of functioning of the nerve. So would you leave the microscopic disease behind and leave it for your radiation oncologist to cover that? And does it have any influence on the overall or recurrence free survival? So it, what what the, the problem is you can't leave macroscopic disease, right? So what you try to do is you try to remove macroscopic disease. If you do leave, remember the, the margin, if you're trying to leave the nerve, the margin will always be close. So it'll never be R0, it'll be R1, right? Because less than two millimeters is an involved margin. So it'll always be an R1 resection if you, try, if you preserve the nerve. And so I always think in th those cases, radiotherapy has a role. And it actually, I mean, it's something that we always use for, um, you know, those kind of tumors. The thing I would say, some of these tumors do recur, but they recur sort of in the chest. So adenoid cystic, if you get adenoid cystic, invariably it'll recur in the chest. It usually isn't local regional, uh, local recurrence, local regional recurrence is usually in the chest. I don't know what you think, Dr. Arif, but you may. For uh, adenoid cystic carcinomas, as you correctly pointed out, 
Uh, the problem is uh, distant metastasis. You may get local control, but you probably never tend to cure these patients. If you follow them up for about 50, 20 years down the line, you find that almost 70 to 80 percent of patients at some point in time will fail, and most of them tend to do that in the in the lung as such. I mean, uh, with adenoid cystic carcinoma, obviously the main thing is perineal invasion, and given the close proximity of the facial nerve within the parotid region. When you treat adenoid cystic of the parotid, then you cover what you call the facial nerve as well, up to the skull base, which basically, I mean, although when I'm speaking, it looks very good that I have a very good understanding, your standard field of radiotherapy actually will incorporate the facial nerve within its volume as such. So don't worry, most of you who are treating are already doing it, but just knowing the theory also tends to help at times. Yeah, I know what I mean. Actually, regarding oral cavity, what is your definition of adequate margins? Is it like one millimeter or is it like more than one millimeter is taken as adequate? And in case it's a closed margin, what is your approach in that case, Dr. Arif? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, do you want to, I'll do the no, no, no. The professor has uh, the right to answer first. He goes ahead first and then I'll take it. Uh, well, I think so because she's, she's quite asked the question to the surgeon, because it's the surgeons are always a bit cagey about the margins. The, oh, the, um, the radiologist always point fingers. But anyway, um, what I would say is historically uh, it's five millimeters. So anything more than five millimeters is a clear margin. Anything more than two is a close margin. Anything less than two is an involved margin or close margin. Um, the problem is there is no evidence for this. It's historic. There is no papers. Now, they have done meta-analysis looking at oral cavity cancers and looking at margins. Because remember, margins is important for local control. So we're not looking at regional control. So that's lymph nodes. It's local control. And I think the meta-analysis suggests that anything more than 2.2, 2.3 millimeters does not increase your risk of getting local recurrence. Okay? So I would say that I'm generally happy with anything more than 3 my MDT is generally happy with anything more than three. And so we don't tend to give um, local, radio so local radiotherapy to the tumor bed if it's more than three, as long as there's no other factors. So you've got to start looking at the, the aggressive nature of the disease. You have to look at PNI, LNI, and the other bits and the, and the stage. So if it's T3, T4 with PNI, LNI, even with a clear margin, you'd give radiotherapy. So I think it's a lot more nuanced than what is a good margin. But that's the kind of the the, the systemic meta analysis. I will leave that to. Well, one of the impressions is that if you have thousands of patients in a paper, then the evidence tends to be very good. You know that this five millimeter where it came from and the paper which it only had twelve patients, and it is one of the most significant papers in head and neck cancer. Because what they did with those 12 patients is they actually measured the distance, how far the tuber actually goes. And they were able to tell that it is very rare for a squamous cell carcinoma to be beyond 5 millimeters. So that paper actually only had 12 patients. Uh, I can't remember actually the author of the paper. But on the basis of that, that 5 millimeter K, because having tumor, viable tumor cells beyond five millimeters was not seen. So it's more, it was a consensus as such that five millimeter was considered as adequate. Later on, that five millimeter came down to three millimeters because they said that five millimeter, once you do the frozen, what you call this uh, fixation, the, the specimen tends to shrink. So basically the three millimeter which you are seeing is actually five millimeter. So most of the clinicians then accepted that even if you have a margin of three millimeters, they would consider it adequate. If you have a margin which is less than a millimeter, that would be considered as positive. I think uh, given uh, in our hospital, I've treated over 21 years and almost uh, 15 to 16,000 patients as such. Our three millimeter margin is a good margin as such. So if you get a patient, at least in Shagat Khanam Hospital, who has a margin of three millimeters, consider it adequate. 
You don't need to offer post-operative radiotherapy if the margin is three millimeter and that is the only risk factor. If there are other factors like poorly differentiated, perineural invasion, lipovascular invasion, node positivity, do it. But solely on the basis of margin, three millimeters on its own as a single factor does not require post-operative local radiotherapy. Three millimeters, anything less than three millimeters, irradiate. Or send them back to surgeons? Send back to surgeons, <laughs> you won't operate. Well, I won't operate, but I'm glad we agreed. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so, I'm uh, Dr. Kuratul Badar. I'm a radiation oncologist working at Zaudin Hospital, Karachi. So, we always seen that there is some difference of opinions treating uh, head and neck cancer, especially the oral cavity. Uh, it's I can say that it's a trans-provincial difference maybe because uh, we have seen uh, some sort of a more aggressive nature of tumor in our site rather than maybe in comparatively in Punjab as compared to Sin. Uh, like in Karachi, uh, the most the most of the patients have the high risk uh, factors like they are pan, chalia, tobacco chewing. And I don't think so that is a major component of uh, the head and neck cancers here in Punjab. So my question is from Dr. Harif as, uh, sir, have uh, are you thinking that there is some association of these risk factors, pan, chalia, and tobacco chewing, along with the cervical nodal metastasis, because there are a few papers which say that uh, if 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 there is a tobacco use, so there is a there is a very high chances of having a cervical nodal metastasis uh, as compared to patients who do not. And what we have seen in our area that we have to, you know, in, in tongue, we have to radiate bilaterally, even if it is a T1 and 1 disease and uh, even if it is a if if you are going to treat a tongue we have to treat it bilaterally we can't omit the contralateral tongue in that side although we uh, we reserve uh, the epilateral uh, treating site only in the like in the oral cavity if it is a buccal and uh, rmt or the alveolar so we can in that cases we can just treat uh, epilateral but in the tongue we have to treat bilaterally so what is your opinion regarding this Kuru Dulayan uh, trained at uh, Al Khan and then moved to Ziaudi. But working at Ziaudi like, for the last 10, 12 years now. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, uh, your question itself, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, our tumors, which we see in South Asia, basically the question is, are tumors in South Asia more aggressive than what is seen in the West? I think uh, in terms of uh, aggressiveness, uh, it is the risk factors which we already know and are pretty well established. The size of the tumor, the grade of the tumor, involvement, perineural invasion, lymphovascular, those risk factors are the same. The reason why we tend to see more neck and more metastasis and more contralateral is because early cancer is rare in this region we tend to see more patients with more advanced tumors. T3, T4s, already the contralateral neck is at risk. Some of these tumors, we tend to stage them, and by the time they come to treatment, they already have advanced. Squamous cell carcinomas have a doubling time of how many days? We asked the panel, the three of uh, our uh, stalwarts, Akil, what is the doubling time of a squamous cell carcinoma of a headman? G? 56 days. Prostate, uh, Maria, we bet you. you. Ask Maria in the back. Asha, bet you. Hard. All three of you come to a consensus. What is the doubling time of a squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck? 46 days. What is it? Five days. I mean, these are the most rapidly growing tumors in the human body as such. So by the time you see it and by the time you operate on it, already you will find that most of those patients have waited one to two months or even more before they come down to surgery or for radiotherapy. So for a tumor with a doubling time of five days, when you leave these patients for that length, a UK is no different either. I mean, they're over there, the waiting time is also that long. So <laughs> from that perspective, you know, you know yeah, so I'll just, um, I think, if I understand, Swalcom Salam is the you said the she was more been a bit more nuanced. She said the difference between Punjab and 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 Karachi. So she was actually highlighting the difference not from the West, but actually that because of the higher 
uh, use of pan and, and, and stuff, that the Punjab is like the, the tumors are less aggressive. So I can't talk about the Punjab and Shokot Khan and, and Karachi because obviously I don't work um, in the Punjab. But in terms of the UK, so I work in North London and that is full of um, Asians. OK, so Indians, Gujaratis, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and they do a lot of pan as well. And we do get very, very aggressive tumors. And look, millions of people have pan, but only certain subset get submucous fibrosis and then certain subset get oral cancers. I find from my clinical practice, they're very aggressive, inherently very aggressive. And they do present at a later stage generally because of the usually low socioeconomic. But I think it's an it's a it's a lot to do with genetics. It's a lot a lot to do with the, you know, obviously pan, but they tend to be more aggressive and they tend to be younger patients. And it's to do with, obviously, there's a, we don't fully understand cancer, but it has to do something with immune surveillance. It has to do something about, you know, and the fact that the immune system isn't picking this stuff up. And you're right, they do go to contralateral uh, um, the side. And what we tend to do in our clinical practice is, especially for Asian patients, is we tend to be a little bit more aggressive um, because you'll find usually with the Caucasian people, they're usually a bit older and the, the tumor is less aggressive, okay? And so we, in T2 stroke T3, we tend to do offer contralateral neck radiotherapy, but usually at a lower dose. So we, maybe not 60, maybe 54. 54 yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I do understand radio yeah. oncology. So that's what we tend to do, but that's from like the West. But yeah. from the Punjab and the, you know, Aga Khan, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Actually, the, 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 the risk factor, uh, which maybe I, I'm thinking is the Gutka, which has something which is very unusual from the maybe you are, you're talking about a pan only, but or, we are talking about Gutka. And gutka. gutka is something very, okay. All right. yeah, it's, it says, I think it's crushed glass, even added in the Gutkas as well. I am not sure, but okay. what we have read about it, the Gutka. So Gutka is very common in, in and, Kanaki, yeah. So, so yeah, that's I mean, maybe... Yeah. Disrupt the lymphatics and all that. I mean, I mean, it's like um, we. I get a lot of floor of mouth tumors. It's very uncommon in the Asian subcontinent, yeah. and that's because they drink alcohol in the West, and so alcohol pools in the floor of mouth, and we get a lot of uh, floor of mouth tumors. It's uh, because it's to do with the you know the demographics. Yeah. One of the things uh, we tend to do is to find something which will make our paper unique. Uh, we can put a say, young patients with aggressive tumors, old patients with aggressive tumor, gutka with aggressive tumor, pan with aggressive tumors. At the end of the day, it is your stage of the tumor, the T stage, which dictates what's going to happen to the neck as such. For small superficial tumors with minimal depth of invasion, you will hardly find. But once the T stage increases, the depth of invasion increases, the chances of neck nodal metastasis will right. increase. And to make your life simple, my own principle, I agree with you that uh, tongue cancer is a very aggressive disease. For note positive, I always treat bilateral neck, irrespective of whatever is taught in the books. Yes. If I have a patient with tongue cancer and the neck is positive, I would certainly irradiate at least level one, two, three on the contralateral side. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, just that's, thank you. Just to that's no, fine, it's fine. Just to echo that sentiment. I mean, we know that the staging system has changed, so the depth of invasion is part of staging now. So if you do get something that's more than four millimeters or five millimeters, then it becomes actually stages up. And then I offer something which is um, something called super selective selective neck, which is essentially a central node, and that is using just like breast uh, radioactive dye and then injection and. I do get cases where you get contralateral nodes that come up, which means there is a drainage pattern to the contralateral node that's anatomical. But I've also had some cases in the last year where it's been positive on the contralateral side, although it has been very, very small. I mean, it's a whole topic in itself, but it's very, very small deposits. And whether it's actually clinically relevant and that immune surveillance wouldn't have got rid of it is something that we don't know, but just out of interest. Just to add, we have seen so many patients with T1, maybe, and not disease in the in, in the in the neck, and we have, uh, you know, just keep the patients on the surveillance, and we found the contralateral nodal metastasis, uh, and so this, that is very common uh, in in that side. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Atif. Thank you, sir. As alaikum. I'm this guy has treated more with uh, the M knife. Uh, no, what is it? Uh, Steatectin. He treated 500 patients with stereotactic in six months. We won't hold that he, against him. He holds the world record. He's in the Guinness's book. I was actually what you call I'm not going to hold that against him. Okay, assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Atif Mancha, uh, 
radiation oncologist from Dow University Hospital in Karachi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, my question one is that uh, in certain cases in hernia cancers, where the disease is close to midline, like tonsil disease or disease in the uh, retomolar trigone, moving towards the uh, pterygoids area. Uh, so sometimes the patient come to us after surgery and there is epsilateral leg dissection. Uh, so will will uh, should we offer contralateral neck radiation in such cases uh, in the neck which has not been addressed surgically, or we should wait for the thickness to happen in the contralateral neck and let the surgery have done on that uh, contralateral side and then offer radiation in adjuvant setting. Number two. So shall we answer that one yeah, first? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, so the question is about uh, say T three tongue, for example, right crossing the midline. I think in those cases, T3 tongues crossing the midline or close to midline, I think you should you should offer a contralateral neck dissection surgically. In terms of once you've done the ipsilateral neck, and then what do you do uh, about radiotherapy? I think we've already alluded to the fact that I think most um, oncologists tend to offer contralateral uh, radiation at a, maybe a lower dose, like a 54 grays. Um, the reason why we shouldn't do a watch and wait policy is that if you wait and and the and, and the node, you know, you get a um, a node or failure or neck failure, then usually it's upstage because usually you'll only detect it late and with ECS, and so by then it's really a lot more aggressive. So ideally, you want to be treating it with the radiotherapy or surgery in the first instance, and avoid doing surveillance because then it upstages it and actually is poor prognosis for the patient. Is what I think. Okay. Uh, I'm. Basically, your question is what to do with contralateral neck in a patient who is positive on the ipsilateral side. Yeah. Is that your question or? Exactly. That. That's my question. Uh, not always positive, but the disease is close to midline. It is not crossing the midline like in tonsils. It's or, close to or, midline. Yeah. And what we do, right? Yeah. If you have a tumor which is T3 or T4, irrespective of the fact whether it is approaching the midline, crossing the midline, on the midline, at the midline, doesn't matter. T3, T4 will require bilateral irradiation. Rule of thumb, you have a patient T3 and T4, treat bilateral neck. Forget about midline. Really, it's not going to change it. If you have a T1 or T2 tumor, if it is what you call away from the tip and what you call not up to the midline, which is basically a millimeter up to the midline. In that situation, if the ipsilateral neck is positive, then you will treat the contralateral neck. Okay. If the ipsilateral neck is negative, you don't need to bother with the contralateral neck. If it is involving the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, if I show you my, is not just the tip, it is about the anterior most one centimeter of the tongue is basically your tip of the tongue. If the tumor is on the tip of the tongue, you must consider irradiating the quadrilateral there. So T3 and T4, always, irrespective of whatever it may be, you treat contralateral. T1, away from the tip. Ipsilateral is negative, no need to treat contralateral. If the tip is involved, you must, what you call, at least consider treating the contralateral. And most of the time, you should treat contralateral. So in this case, uh, if, if the tumor size is small and it, and it is T4 only on the basis of the bone involvement, so still we should offer the contralateral neck radiation. Right. You have a tongue tumor which has involved, sorry, an oral cancer, which is, see your alveolus cancer. Even for small tumors of the alveolus, I mean, one centimeter, 1 1.5, you have, what you call bone involvement, if bone involvement comes. If there is bone involvement for an alveolus tumor, you only need to, for alveolus tumor, you it is lateralized and you just treat the contralateral side. But if the ipsilateral side is positive, again, go back to the same principle. If ipsilateral is positive, at least consider two, three, four, one, two, three on the contralateral side. So for bone involvement, I see it does make, but keep in mind that bone involvement has to be marrow involvement. Bone erosion or just the uh, involvement of the bone itself does not make it T4 for alveolus. It would be involvement of the marrow. And for alveolus tumor, if it is away from the midline, just treat the ipsilateral. If ipsilateral is positive, 
then you must consider irradiating the contralateral. And they too will go for buccal mucosa. Okay. Question number two is that uh, in certain cases uh, during surgery, the margins are positive and uh, the surgeon goes for deep extended margin. And there is no mention of the number, the distance between the distance between the margins and the, and the tumor. Uh, so they, they just said that deep extended margin is negative and we don't have numbers. So how to proceed in, in these cases? Okay, so different oncologies do different things. Yeah. So I think it depends on what you mean by an involved margin. Is it, you know, one to two millimeters or less than one millimeter, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is, did they do a flap and did they have to go back? The third thing is, like, how do you know where you've taken this, this specimen from? You don't. So I think from, from a general point of view, if it's a small lateralized tongue and you didn't do a flap, you can always go back and take a further margin if it's like two millimeters, for example. But I think anything less than a millimeter or with um, tumor at the margin, I think most of my oncologists would say for, radi for, for radiation. The morbidity is awful in terms of radiation. You don't really want it for a small tumor, but you can't really go back to the same spot. But I think if it's like more than a couple of millimeters, uh, you could do a further deep margin because you know where everything is. And, and I think most oncologists usually say it's a small T1. We would just do clinical monitoring because it's not buried. You can see it and you can clinically monitor it. So I think it's very nuanced. And I think it's a discussion that you have to have with the patient because they must understand the, the um, let's have a look. You've got a two millimeter margin. They must understand the morbidity of radiotherapy versus the potential benefit of reducing local recurrence, which is what 8% maybe, right? A and then further surgery. So I think it's a discussion between the oncologist, the patient and the MDT, but it's a lot more nuanced if it's like close. But obviously if it's less than a millimeter, and you've had a flap, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it goes without saying, I think you should, you know, do radiotherapy. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think actually uh, there's this conventional teaching of go back and take an extra margin, but uh, we had a discussion before all of our patients, we have taken an extra margin that never came back positive. Yeah. Uh, the damage is done with the first cut. Either you're going to cure him or you're not going. Once you have achieved a, what you call the first time you do an excision and you end up with a positive margin, the fate of the patient has already been decided. Taking extra margins, although it is done in practice, but the prognosis of the patient depends on what happened first time. So it is so important that the first cut should be a clean cut. If the cut is not clean, it already becomes an indication for post-op radiotherapy. That surgery is then a suboptimum surgery. Although they can go back and clear the margin, which is a very difficult thing. You don't know where it was positive from. But, and most of the time when they do a re-excision, there is no tumor over there. But from the prognosis point of view, your first cut will actually dictate what happens in the future for that patient. So if you see a pathology report where it says the margin was positive and then an extra margin was taken, which was negative, that doesn't, what you call, mean that that patient had cleared margins and there is no need for radiation. Radiation is dictated because the first cut was through the tumor and that is what is going to affect his prognosis and that is your justification for doing post-op radiotherapy. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll introduce all the people who are asking questions. Sadia is, uh, I know, Sadia is the, now the head of the department and she's the one who has stepped into my shoes and she does all the head and neck and they, 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 another one. Hello, uh, sorry, I missed um, your talk. I was in a paper session. I'm Sadia, I'm a consultant in clinical oncology. A uh, question for both of you. I was practicing in UK where we don't use induction chemotherapy for locally advanced oral cancers. But when I moved back to Pakistan, working with Dr. Arif, I just saw amazing results. T3, T4, inoperable. We gave two cycles of induction and then they just melt. I think there is a different tumor biology um, in the Western world and where we are treating now. So my question to you is, what's your experience about induction chemotherapy for oral cavity cancers? I know UK is not very keen because often these patients go on to have surgery followed by radiation, and then that just adds to their morbidity. I actually recently wrote something about this. Um, but I think it's a little bit, 
So I used to work in a sarcoma unit and for sarcoma, it's a systemic disease. Everyone got um, chemo up front because it's a systemic disease. And then there was a, a period where you used to give neoadjuvant chemo in the UK. Um, and But a lot of the results are a little bit inconclusive, right? And I think it's to do, you're right, it's to do tumor biology. Um, I think it depends on the unit and there are trials going on currently. Uh, things like NICO, there's a few trials going on where they are looking at stage three, stage four, tumors and giving them um, neoadjuvant chemo a couple of doses beforehand and then using scans to go to the original resection margins and doing that and it's something that i think there is there's something in it but just, you're right there just isn't enough evidence um so what you know and it's it's unfortunate because a lot of the cases that we get when they get to t4b they become unresectable and we tend to think well there's no point it i think it's because in head and neck, the morbidity is so bad, right? And when you've got maxillary, mandibular, you know, um, retromandibular trigone with basal skull involvement, with the pterygoid plate involvement, and it's difficult to get a clear bony margin, sometimes you just think, is it worth putting them through all of that and the morbidity and the, all the problems associated with it, swallowing, speech, et cetera, et cetera, whether it's worth putting them through surgery? And it's that because it doesn't always go right. And it obviously um, affects the way you think about your next patient because it's really horrible when things go wrong, right? And then you think, okay, fine, you know what? Let's just do pall palliative chemo, palliative radiotherapy, or give them immuno, uh, you know, um, if they if they get the PDL. And and I think that's what it is because surgeons are like res a little bit resistant in the West. And I, I can understand when you've got really, really like high stage disease, where yes, the chemo may reduce it, but ultimately the margins will have to be very similar and the morbidity is going to be very similar uh, is the fact that is it worth it sometimes? Because invariably these high stage aggressive tumors have positive nodes, which means in very, you know, that means their prognosis is reduced and their two year survival is pretty poor. And so it's always that, as I said, the more you do, the more you realize it's like a fine balance and sometimes you can't cure everyone. Dr. Arif, your experience is totally different. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, we are all from day one taught that there's no survival benefit for the induction chemotherapy. But I don't do induction chemotherapy to improve survival. When you have a patient with oral cancer, he comes to your clinic. The first thing is he has got symptoms, which has, he has got severe pain. He has got an ulcer or a tumor which is fungating and he is in misery. Induction chemotherapy provides rapid palliation of those symptoms. It is the quickest way of palliating it. If the patient is fit, the first thing you want to do is to get rid of his symptoms. The second thing which you want, I give chemotherapy, is to cover for the interval between his definite treatment, because chemo is not the treatment. It's either going to be surgery or it's going to be radiotherapy. So it will provide you an uh, what you call a window where you can at least prevent the tumor from increasing his size. So one, I relieve his symptoms. Two, I cover for the period before he starts his definite treatment. Three, I downstage that patient, which provides reducing the extent of surgery or radiotherapy, which you may be planning to do. And fourthly, when you have a situation where you are not sure whether this is a radical or a palliative patient, then chemotherapy is, there is nothing like it. With chemotherapy, you can select your patients. Those who respond to chemotherapy will respond to radiation. Rule of thumb. If you have a patient who is responding to chemotherapy, will also have a response to radiation. Especially when you get these hypopharyngeal cancers, you don't know this guy is not swallowing, he is not talking, he has got this big tumor over here, and the age of the patient is 26. All the residents are crying, oh, young patient, you're going to make him palliative. If he hasn't responded to chemotherapy, he's not going to respond to radiotherapy, treat palliatively. But if the response is there, it gives an opportunity for radical treatment to come in place. So forget about survival. Look at the other benefits of induction chemotherapy, palliation of symptoms, downstaging the tumor, recovering for the definite treatment, changing what you call your treatment plan from a 
palliative one to a radical one. So all those benefits outweigh the advantages of chemotherapy doing that as compared to not doing it. So next time when you do, forget about survival, look at the other benefits and you will justify it. I guess the aim of treatment is so, very different in Western world and in Pakistan. Obviously, Everyone we have who has population. a workload of oral cancer yeah. or these advanced tumors, they mm. all do chemotherapy. When it comes to survival, that is the only time they say there is no, okay, we accept the fact there is no survival. Forget about the survival. Ground reality or real world medicine is totally different. I think chemotherapy is one of the most effective tools you have in a head and neck cancer. And for the reasons which I mentioned, getting rid of the symptoms, downstaging the disease, converting a palliative patient into a radical one, all those are such important benefits that it just underlines the, or underscores the importance of chemotherapy in these patients. Sure. Thank you very much. So we've got a few online questions as well. Uh, one for Dr. Ahmed. Uh, when you talked about uh, the parotid neoplasms uh, and you were doing the frozen section, sir. Question is, when frozen is done for the nerve, what tissue is sent? Perineural sheath tissue or the nerve itself? Um, one question from you and one from Sami, and that's it, right? Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, yeah. I try not to do frozen of the nerve, but usually it's going to be a peripheral branch or, or a, a part of the nerve where the tumor is invading. Uh, but uh, frozens are useless, really, for nerve, unfortunately. Uh, the pathologists don't come to an agreement. So my question, taking your focus away from radiations, uh, really, it's about reconstruction. So in cases where you resect the facial nerve, uh, and I've seen that you're probably an advocate of immediate nerve recon with the nerve grafts and nerve transfers or, you know, vascularized nerve grafts. Uh, in patients who are going to get adjuvant immediate recon, uh, and what would be the type of recon in those cases, or you would delay the recon for later? So, okay, there's a, there's a couple of things. Uh, there's been papers to show that having radiotherapy post non-vascularized nerve graft, the, the success rate is very similar. There's not much difference. It's usually the age of the patient and the neuroplasticity that makes the difference. In terms of are they going to have radiotherapy, the fact that you've removed the nerve means it's T4, means they'll get radiotherapy. That's invariably going to be the case. So you know that's coming. The, sometimes the reason to do it is basically because it keeps the, the muscles active. And so, you know, if you've connected the peripheral nerves, then you're keeping the muscles and the nerve active, which means the muscles are functioning. Otherwise, you'll have to later on end up doing some sort of gracilis or some sort of muscle because you'll need muscle because they'll atrophy with no innovation. So even if it's if you don't get the best outcome, it's still a way of keeping the muscles active in, in so free nerve graft. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but my understanding is that once you have resected the nerve, you have, uh, you know, uh, denervated the muscle. Uh, and even if you put a nerve graft, that nerve graft has to grow the distance of the defect for it to, you know, actually re innovate the muscle. Um, yeah, the success rate is variable because remember, you're not removing the peripheral branches. Usually the tumor is at the, at the, one, uh, in, in the base of it. So you're not going to remove all the peripheral branches. So you're connecting the main facial stump to a peripheral branch. So you're right. I mean, obviously, it's variable. The success rate is variable, but it's it's a way of trying to get innovation in as, as best you can. And I just, uh, although I'm not a surgeon, but uh, I can make a comment over here. If you have what you call, once the facial nerve is involved, that itself is an indication for post-op radiotherapy. So if you're going to do reconstruction, do it immediately. Because once that has been irradiated, it will become more difficult for you. So if you have what you call uh, the facial nerve is involved, that patient needs radiotherapy irrespective of whatever it is. So do your reconstruction before they do the radiotherapy and make your job more difficult. If you see a irradiated parotid bed, you know how. There you go. I think uh, they've got a plenary session, so yep. we have to one clear small, the... Yeah, sorry. Are we one done? Second.
Yeah, I think we are all hungry, but I think Umar has one last one, question. One last, for one last uh, small question. So, uh, do you regularly do level one in parotid tumors? <laughs> you did. You did remove level one in your parotid case. Uh, do I do level one in parotid tumors? Yeah. I think the case was a, a T4 or T3 prostate yeah. tumor. Okay. And I think I ended up, I think it was maybe a skin malignancy. Uh, and so I did a, a one to five. Because okay. with skin malignancies, I tend to do one to five because they can go to level five. And yeah, I would have done one. Okay, one more thing. And uh, the patient in which you showed us the radial forearm free flap, is there a concern for the radial forearm free flap to hang when you are reconstructing the soft pilot? So I do deep stitches. I okay. use a, put a tube down to lift the pharynx up. And then I do deep stitches to embed it and to give, because what you're trying to do is hold it up. So yeah, it doesn't usually flap back. And uh, post radiation. That, that's like, that's like three questions. That's, that's my process, <laughs> I think. You're, okay, that, uh, yeah. I'll make the final comment on uh, pyrotide and nodes as well. Your take-home message, if you want to do neck dissection for your parotid tumors, look for two things. The histology, if it is aggressive, if it is what you call high-grade mucoepidermoid, adenoid cystic, slivery duct carcinoma, high-grade adenocarcinoma, then neck dissection is justified. For low-grade mucoepidermoid, uh, Wharton's tumors and others, you don't need to worry about the neck. The main thing is, what do you dissect in the neck? So you can go home and read it and let me know when we make next year. Hopefully, Dr. Raza doesn't give us any more shocking news. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. For Thank coming. you, guys. The research session of uh, 23rd Shokar Khan Memorial Cancer Hospital Symposium. And uh, uh, I am Saira Salim. I work as a research scientist at uh, Basic Sciences Research Department of Shokat Khanam Cancer Hospital in Lahore. And uh, I am very honored that I am joined by Dr. Naila Malkani. Uh, she is the assistant professor at uh, Government College University. And uh, let's uh, begin with the uh, session. Uh, please invite our first uh, speaker. And good afternoon, everyone. So the first talk is by Professor Jazik Godmold. He's a professor in genetics and path pathology at International Hereditary Cancer Research from Iranian Medical University, Poland. And today he's going to talk about prophylactic and treatment of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, where we are. So please welcome Professor Jazik Godmold. Oh, Oh, now it works better. Thank you very much for invitation. I would like to tell some words about prophylactic and tr treatment uh, of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. But before we go to main subject, so of course we have to talk about penetrance. Why we are talking about hereditary cancers? Because mutation carriers, people with strong family history have a much higher risk of developing of breast and ovarian cancer in case of BRCA1, BRCA2 carriers. And in, uh, let's say, perfect situation, it would be the best to have the table like this one, that we have patient, let's say, first degree relative mutation carrier, and that we say in age of 30, so it is no risk of for BRCA1, BRCA2 carrier, no risk of ovarian cancer. But if you will be... Uh, in age of, let's say, uh, uh, 70, it will be 30% uh, percent risk of ovarian cancer. And it's the same story for breast cancer. Unfortunately, all of these studies have some kind of bias. And what kind of bias, uh, so I will tell you. So we did uh, very extensive studies with Canadian groups, with Polish, with some Norwegian, and uh, so many countries from with Canadians, Americans, uh, estimation for ovarian cancer. And it is possible even to evaluate one year risk, yeah? So we can precisely tell to the patient that your risk of developing in Next year, it will be, let's say, 1% or 2%. Uh, cumulative risk is also on some extent. It's only question where these data are coming from. In the past, most of data uh, were coming from, uh, est estimations were coming from strong families because only these families were tested. But, and look, 
Yeah, so we have genetic modification of breast cancer risk in BRCA1, BRCA2 carriers according to family history. And the second uh, column, it is when we have carrier 